I know it's been a while, haven't talked since July. You've been on my mind, don't hang up. I know it's been some time since I called you mine. You've been on my mind, don't hang up. Maybe I'm a little bit jealous, haven't told my friends we ended it. Yeah, I know that it is wrong. Maybe it's a little bit selfish calling you up when I'm wasted When I know that you moved on Is she in your arms right now? Tell me is she gonna stay the night? Tell me is she in your arms right now? Is she in your arms Talk things through. Tell me what to do. Don't give up. After all that we've been through, I give my all to you. Just tell me what to do. Don't give up on me. Yeah, baby, I'm a little bit jealous. Haven't told my friends we ended it. Yeah, I know that it's wrong. It's wrong. It's baby, it's a little bit selfish. When I know that you moved on Is she in your arms right now? Tell me is she gonna stay the night? Tell me is she in your arms right now? Is she in your arms Calling you up when I'm wasted When I know that you moved on Is she in your arms right now? Tell me is she gonna stay the night? Tell me is she in your arms right now? Is she in your arms tonight? Like I used to Like I used to be
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to um, attempt number two of this. Um, I'd, I'd like to start off the stream by saying I do apologise for uh, the attempted streaming this earlier today. I should have... Uh, hindsight is a wonderful thing and I should have uh, A. Done some testing B. Moved the stream back because I wasn't in a fantastic place mentally at that point because we'd been told uh, we'd been given 90 minutes notice that we were going to lockdown um, I'd just been running around doing things I was dealing with uh, another half, my other half who of course every time we go into lockdown it's like you know a dagger through the heart to basically say haha you don't get to go see your family overseas for even longer so yeah I hindsight again wonderful thing I should have just read the room and gone you know what you probably need to uh, just push this stream back till you're in a uh, good place but the good news is I had a nap I ate some food I did a workout and everything's all right again so and I've also done some testing and I know it works so I'm not even you know gonna get overly frustrated at that so again my apologies I am only human but um, yes I need to uh, obviously just realize sometimes and go, you know what? Yes, it's going to probably annoy people if I cancel or move something back, but it's worth it for the uh, quality of the streams. And I honestly, you know, like usually when I would have a situation like what happened early today, I would come back, you know, I'd be back within a couple of minutes. I was just in that uh, headspace of screw this. That can bugger off. I'm not dealing that with that right now. I don't have the capacity to deal with that. And I just ended it there and there. So, again, for a third time, my bad. But, now we good. Now we good. And you can probably tell in my voice and my demeanor as well. I'm a lot more, woo. So, and I promise it's not uh, alcohol or drug induced. I want to make that very clear but anyway uh mr tim brown is off to lunch today so enjoy your lunch tim if you're still hanging around black evo mate welcome to the stream it is lovely to have you here any of the other uh seven viewers feel free to make yourselves known i'd like to uh obviously say hi to you and make sure that you're all doing well too etc but um, whilst you guys say hello and all that, I will get this plane started. Uh, seems that the weather has uh, come to the party on this uh, flight today, which is good. It's a nice um, thing to see, especially considering the weather that we arrived here into uh, Recife with last night. When we did that stream, it was, <laughs> it was not great weather, so... Hey, calling pigeon, mate. Good morning to you. I hope you are doing well. So I'm just going to go for about 3,500 feet on this um, flight. Because there's no real mountainous terrain that we're going to come across or anything like that. So we'll be quite uh, safe to do that. But, um... Oh, I just realized I haven't even hooked up my track IR. You know what? Not important right now. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll get out, we'll get flying, and I'll make sure that the track IR is all set up and ready to go for uh, the landing in a few hours' time. But, um, right. Is, uh... I should probably have a look at the airport and see if... Oh, yeah. I've got uh, Black Evo, I've got Verudin, I've got uh, Kangaroo... Hey Wes, um, this is the cooking stream. The original cooking stream did not go well. At all. Uh, there's a reason that the video evidence doesn't even exist on YouTube anymore of how it went. But um, the good news is we're good. We're back. We're going to do it again. This time we're going to nail it, hopefully. I'm optimistic. 
Why won't... Uh, oh, no, it does work. Okay, cool. That's fine. All right. Well, I guess I will remove the sparking brake. And we will taxi out to the runway. So, as we did uh, on the stream earlier today, I will taxi out. We will take off. We will uh, fly out, get up to cruising altitude. And then I will bring the uh, cooking video in and we can just all sit back, relax, and uh, watch an amazing chef. No. <laughs> I wish. But, um, no, it'll, it'll be good fun to... Uh, have the stream partially being done for me by um, my uh, clone, I guess, is how the best way to refer to it. And uh, if you do have any questions during the uh, cooking demonstration and all that, I'm going to be here the whole time with you. Uh, yeah, exactly. Where's the Swedish chef? That's exactly right. Um, I gotta cook the chucky, you know, cook the chucky. Erpa derpa derpa. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was I saying? I was saying something, probably can't have been that important if I can't remember. Uh, oh yes, 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 sorry. If you do have any questions in relation to the cooking that is being demonstrated in front of you, um, obviously do ask, even though you won't be able to see my webcam because the video will be going and I don't want to take up uh, so much space of the flying scenery as well with too many uh, bits and bobs on the screen. Um, yeah, I will be here. I will let you guys know if I'm not here. Um, so if you have any questions, need any tips or, you know, whatever, please ask away. I'm happy to pause the video. I'm happy to do whatever. Um, yeah. Ah, oh, Oz Flight Simmer, you lurking awesome legend. Thank you so much for that uh, five bucks. It is real life, Brett. Things happened um, in the stream earlier today and instead of me coming back uh, from crashing issues and all that, I gave up. Uh, just is what it is. It was... As I was saying to the blokes just before, I should have uh, should have read my own room and moved the stream back because I wasn't in a fantastic place to be doing the stream earlier today. Um, I should have just done it. I didn't. I screwed up. Anyway, now here's the uh, redemption, basically. Uh, do you have a question? Do I do Uber Eats? Um, no, because Uber Eats charges 35% commission or something ridiculous like that. So they can get... They're not good for food businesses. Don't let anyone try and tell you otherwise. Um, Clive says, good evening. How are you all? Still got Sims problems on loading up. Doesn't want to. Hey, Clive. That's um, not good news, mate, but I, I'm i doing well. Uh, I hope you're doing well as, to, as well, mate. Well, yeah, actually, you're right, Black Eva. I didn't give up. I uh, required, well, more than a moment. I required um, a bit of anger, a bit of gym workout, a bit of a shower, uh, a bit of food, <laughs> and a nap. <laughs> Basically, I was a cranky, hangry asshole who had just been delivered, yeah, as I said, 90 minutes uh, notice. Oh, by the way, you're going into lockdown. Have a great weekend. I was just like, huh? <laughs> um, Clive, you in the description, there is um, a link that says streamlabs.com slash just some Aussie gamer. If you are that way inclined, that is the way to make a donation to the channel or make a subscription or whatever. Um, I'm assuming that's what you're referring to. Um, that's just simply because I don't have a thousand subs and I can't actually do a super chat uh, setup. So, yeah. 
<laughs> Shane's just paying for my glasses of wine <laughs> whilst we sit here on the runway and hold up the whole uh, Recife airport whilst I have a conversation. But um, enough chatting. Everyone's on the runway. Vruden's already up in the air, it seems. Which is interesting. Shane, you're a legend. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the love, bro. Really, really, really appreciate it. Let's take off. Let's go see some scenery. Let's watch some cooking. Let's have a good time. But um, I'm hoping everyone who is along here today is doing well. I hope everyone's having a good weekend so far, or a good Saturday at least anyway. I know that other than obviously the lockdown news, that I, and obviously the issues I had with the stream, I really can't complain about my day. Um, I managed to get some gym equipment before it was sold out of, so I've got some uh, gym stuff to keep me occupied. Uh, for the next fortnight whilst we're in uh, lockdown. I managed to get some food, I managed to go to the market, I managed to hang out with the missus, I managed to see the dog. So realistically, I cannot complain too much. I've had a pretty decent day. But um, anyone, I mean, I know I asked this question last night as well, but uh, anyone get up to anything interesting, getting up to anything interesting over the weekend? Brett, how was your um, time with the devil himself, other than me? <laughs> oh, Shane, I love you, mate. And that's a... That is a man-to-man, -man, I love you. But genuinely, you're an absolute legend, Shane. Thank you so much. You've dropped $15 to me. Absolute killer bloke. Absolute killer bloke. You're going to make a vlog about it, Brett? Hell yeah. I want to see that. That Grumman Widgeon looks fantastic up there, uh, Black Evo. But thank you so much, Shane. Really, 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 really means a lot. I know you say uh, it's for the wine. You and I both know that I'm not spending that money on wine. I'm spending that money on the uh, channel. Whether it be a game, an add-on, um, equipment, etc. But I appreciate the thought process anyway there, mate. Loving the fact that there's still the double rainbows hanging around uh, Recife here. It is really quite pretty. All these, uh, all this flying through Brazil really, really makes me want to go to Brazil. Like, it is a very, very pretty country from the air. Which means that on the ground, it's probably even better. Maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll use some of that money, uh, Shane, if I, uh, like I'll use it to, you know, purchase something related to the channel, but if I've got any leftover change, like a couple of bucks or whatever, I'll put that aside and use that to save up for the next bottle of wine or gin or whatever. Yeah, um, Shane... I've even had a bit of a play with the Grum and Widgeon. Um, it's it's pretty good. It's pretty good, mate. Not gonna lie. I uh, I can very much recommend and vouch for it being a uh, 
great aircraft to have a play with, especially if you're uh, flying around watery areas. Sorry, Calling Pigeon, we've left you on the ground, I just realised, mate, but um, I guess because you are in the TBM, it's probably not the end of the world. Alright, so we are at our cruising altitude. So, I will very quickly uh, be right back. And I will return with um, the cooking video for everybody's enjoyment. <laughs> Shane, Shane, Shane. <laughs> You're a legend, mate. You are a... Sorry, I've got to say it. I've got to say it. Apologies to anyone who uh, might have small kids around or whatever for this, but you're a fucking legend. You just are. Thank you so much, bro. See? My mood is so much more elevated. I... I don't know what I'd do without you guys, uh... having you guys to stream to and all that. It's such a fantastic community. Anyway, as I said, I will be back in a, a, less than a minute, I would say. Alright, I am still here with you, but um, I'm now going to press play on this uh, video. As I did say, if you have any questions or whatever, uh, please do ask them in the chat and I will stop the video and I will obviously respond. I am still going to be here. But um, for now, sit back, relax and watch, yeah, as Brian just said, uh, just some Aussie chef try and work his magic. <laughs> to make the dough from scratch, obviously. Now, I'm going to be using a KitchenAid mixer. You do not need to have access to a KitchenAid mixer. This is something you can do in a bowl, with a spoon, with a spatula, with your hands, whatever. I'm just making use of equipment that I have access to. So, first thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to take our plain flour, nice and fresh, never opened before, only the best quality here, Woolworths Essentials, <laughs> oh. You're allowed to laugh. Oh. <laughs> Don't worry, my camera woman's allowed to laugh. <laughs> Alright, um, if I can actually open this. I'm not very good at uh, opening things up and getting into the hole. Um, <laughs> so, we need to get the fuck in there. Oh, we're allowed to swear on here? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so that's... That's, that's, that's good enough. That's a cup. So, one cup. It's not a very precise cup. 
you know what, I'm gonna do this with a spoon to fill my cup. I feel like that's probably the easier way to go about this, and that's how a chef would operate. I need to maintain that illusion. more flour on the bench than in the bloody cup. I don't want to be um, raided by the police right now. They're going to think I'm uh, running a coke lab. <laughs> right, get that in. See, even us chefs do shit in uh, messed up ways sometimes. And in fact, the, chefs are renowned for yeah, exactly. taking shots. Chefs short. are renowned for uh, doing things in weird ways. So this is the half cup. So three and a half cups of this into your mixing bowl, whether that's a KitchenAid. I mean, if you don't have a bowl, you can do this on the bench. Literally. Put your flour, put your salt, make a well for where the liquid's going to go, and then you can literally uh, do a course in folding. So if I don't have a KitchenAid, can I just put it in a bowl and massage it together with my hands? You certainly can. Right. In fact, you know, sometimes that's how you, know, how you get the best flavour because you're uh, transferring your love into the food. Your bacteria. <laughs> that too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my recipe says two teaspoons of salt. If you are not um, somebody who likes a lot of salt, obviously cut that back. You know, it's... Uh, kind of a preferential thing here. I'm just gonna do pinches of salt because that's how a chef rolls, so. Do the Italian sprinkle. I've done three pinches of salt. I like salt. What else can I say? And that's it. So now I'm going to bring the mixer down and we're gonna start that on a low speed. And all we're doing right now is we're just combining the flour and the salt together, breaking up any lumps that may be in the flour, and I don't think there will be because it is triple sifted, but it's just a good uh, thing to get used to. just means as well that you're going to have the flavour evenly around the dough with the salt, etc. Now um, I'm just going to clean up my cocaine and we'll come back. <laughs> All right, so I've now mixed that for a couple of minutes to uh, come all together. And if you come a bit closer, you will see that it looks just like a nice, you know, there's not many visible lumps, etc. It looks quite smooth. So now we're adding a cup of water. So take a cup, find your nearest sink, <laughs> fill it up until it's about to come off, come over the top. The bubbles are um, your decision. Now get it in, try not to spill as much as I did. <laughs> uh, clean up your uh, Niagara Falls if you make one. And then that's the water part done. Okay, so the next part of this is to take one egg and beat the shit out of it. So I'm gonna crack it into the bowl, make sure I don't get any shell in there, because that would be extremely shellfish of me. But if you get shell in there, and I know from experience, wet your finger and the shell will stick to it. Even better tip, use the eggshell to take the eggshell out. All right. The eggshell sticks to the eggshell. Okay. Take your fork or whisk or finger if you really want to finger the egg. I, you know, don't recommend that, but if that's all you can do, fantastic. <laughs> I, I like to fork the egg. Um, <coughs> Mad okay, whisking. That's, that's lightly beaten. So as you can see, it's not fully smashed. It's partially smashed. We're not gonna go to jail for aggravated assault for that one. We're just gonna get into a little bit of trouble. <laughs> okay, so the next step is to put your two tablespoons of oil in. Now, I'm using rice bran oil. Recipe does call for vegetable oil. Rice bran, vegetables, sunflower, canola, um, rapeseed, any of those would be uh, really good. If you only have access to olive oil, obviously use that, but do try to avoid it because it does have a low temperature and we are gonna be deep frying these and there is potential for it to impart a bit of flavor in there. So, 
I've got me uh, tablespoon, got me oil, pop it in, like so, one, and five, two, now don't overdo it because otherwise you might get a call from the Middle East and they might want their oil reserves back, so... <laughs> Okay, so the next part of the recipe calls for one and a half teaspoons of white wine vinegar. Now, I have white wine vinegar from Pinot Grigio. It was in my... Fancy! Any, even just white vinegar, plain white vinegar, or worst case scenario, even an apple cider vinegar would probably suffice in this situation. So I've got me 1.5 teaspoon here. Now, those of you who don't have 1.5 teaspoons on your uh, spoon kit... I think they can math. Put one teaspoon in, half a teaspoon. All right, so the next step is to add a white spirit. Ooh. Not, not the ghostly type, <laughs> alcoholic drinkable type. Oh, good, even better. Yeah, um, so the recipe states white rum, vodka, any sort of those white spirits. I have gin, so I'm putting gin in because I quite like gin and I don't like vodka and I don't really like uh, white rum either. <laughs> which is a 50% uh, alcohol gin, so it's nice and strong. So in we're going to go with two and a half teaspoons of white spirit. This is not sponsored, but Locke, if you want to, reach out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, where's me half teaspoon? Yep. Can funny. you pour one for me while you're there? Ah, funny. Okay, and that's all in. Okay, so now that all your ingredients are in your bowl, no matter what it is, even if it's the bench, we're going to get it mixing. So I'm going to start slow so that I don't have flour all over the place because I don't really want to clean that up. Okay? So now that it's mixing, <laughs> call me DJ Rush. Um, yep, I'll leave that to the set. I'm going to get a pot out. I'm going to make a uh, seasoned water. This is for the chicken breast for the cochinia, which is our other dish that we're doing today. Basically, I just need to get that up to temperature so that we can get the chicken in there, so that we can get the chicken cooking within the seasoned water. So, Summer, spring, autumn. Which season are we doing? Um, salt and pepper, actually. Oh. Wrong type of season and wrong type of pot as well, for those who are interested. This one is the one you put water in. <laughs> That's not the type I like, sorry. So, fill it up with kitchen water, not toilet water. Yeah, please. Make sure it's uh, water from a tap, not from the garden hose, not from your toilet, not from your washing machine or your dryer or anything like that. Straight from the kitchen tap. Doesn't have to be filtered, just needs to be <laughs> consumable by um, the regular human being. <laughs> and that's going to go there. To that, I'm going to add some salt, but first off, I'm going to put a little bit more speed into the mixing. Mix it. How much salt are you putting? Um, basically, I want it to be like I've just spent a day at the beach. Cool. And I've uh, almost died from uh, so taking in so much salt water. Three fistfuls? Not, not, no, not quite. <laughs> you just want some nicely seasoned water that reminds you of sea water because you want the flavor to impart into the chicken as quick as possible because the chicken's only going to be in that water for about half an hour okay all right now that we've got uh, a lot of the flour mixed in i'm turning up the speed and basically we just want to mix that mix that mix that mix that mix that until it becomes a dog now, as you can see, there's still a bit of flour going all over the place, but it is starting to come together. So we'll come back to you once that is together, and you'll see what we're looking for. So as you can see, my cochinia water is on, the flame is on, it is doing its thing. We wait for it to come up to temperature, then we'll get the chicken in for that. Okay? Meanwhile, we have the pastille dough. So that's been in the mixer. So because it's been in the mixer, it's going to be a little bit stickier than say you guys who have been doing it by hand or with spoons or whatever speaking of which it will take you at least five to seven minutes of good hard fisting and need <laughs> to get it to where you want it to be don't be scared to add a little bit of flour if it is sticking to your hands 
This is what I'm going to do right now because it is just mildly sticky. I've thrown a little bit of flour on the um, bench and I'm just going to work that in to finish it off. Um, those of you who are using a mixer, whilst it's mixing, feel free to do something constructive, wash your dishes, have a quickie, whatever. <laughs> Gross. So, <laughs> basically we're looking for a nice ball. If you need um, some reference points, look in your pants. Ah. Also, if you're going to do it on the bench like this, make sure, make sure you clean. sanitize the bench, all right? Yeah. Make sure you are. Otherwise, you will bench. definitely get a hairy ball. <laughs> In which case, get the shaver out. <laughs> <and drink. laughs> okay, so now we have a really nice dough. It is pliable. As you nice can see, and smooth. It's very smooth. I can shape it any way I want, as you can see, with ease. So, you take that, give it a slap. Don't forget to always slap the booty. Wow. Now, grab one of those tea towels that I mentioned before. And what we're going to do is we're going to sit that off over there. I'm going to put a little bit of flour on the top. I'm going to lift up and put a little bit of flour underneath just to stop it from sticking to the bench. And I'm literally going to cover it with this tea towel to stop a skin from forming on it. Again, make sure it's a clean tea towel. Yes, clean. This is a word you will hear a lot today, clean. That now needs to sit for 20, 30, 45 minutes, depending on the temperature of the area that you're working in. And then it'll be ready to be shaped and filled with cheese oh. to make the uh, pastille. Yum. Okay, so now it's time to play with your breasts. Lovely. Um, I recommend C Ooh. or D cup, um, or 375 grams is what the recipe actually calls for. <laughs> I'm just going to go for the biggest breast I can see, like most men. <laughs> so basically I'm going to take the breast. I'm only going to use one of these because this is a 700 gram pack of chicken breasts. I'm going to place the biggest one in our seasoned cooking liquid. So the biggest one here, it's nice and plump and firm, exactly what you want. <laughs> Pick it up, place gently into liquid. Try not to steam burn yourself like I almost did. And, and then that's it, 30 minutes. Wash your hands. Yeah, definitely wash your hands. The last thing you want to do is um, share salmonella with the rest of your um, people who you'll be cooking for. And Nope! <laughs> Alright, so your chicken breast is going to bubble away for about half an hour. That's what it should look like. Bryce should never trust me with a camera. Okay, so we've been about half an hour now. The pastille dough is ready, but first, make your way over to me. Come here. That's creepy. Come here. Very creepy. <laughs> so, as you can see, the chicken's doing its thing. It's creating bubbles and foam and all things nice. I can't actually see what it's doing, but it is definitely cooking, 100%. <laughs> so, pastille dough. Let's remove the clean tea Ooh. towel, which is now no longer clean for obvious reasons. Put it in the wash. Okay, it just goes down there. Right. Later. <laughs> oh, that's right. not so a as nice you can see, looking dough. It's a yeah, it's a really nice dough. So basically, it's nicely rested. I think it's uh, had a journey to Bora Bora or something. <laughs> what about me? So we'll go down the middle. So you want to halve the dough, or as best as possible as you can to halve. And then, you simply, and you may need to continuously flour it a bit to stop it from sticking, but you want to roll it out. Now, I've got a rolling pin. If you don't have a rolling pin, use a tin of chickpeas or tomatoes or whatever. If you don't have that, Use a clean glass, use a plastic glass, use a wine bottle, a beer bottle. Anything that is circular that will enable you to roll something out. If you don't have anything at all, God gave you two hands. You're going for as flat as you possibly can without getting holes in it. If you only have your hands, sure, your dough is going to be a little bit thicker than the rest of this. Might take a little bit longer to cook, but guess what? still going to be fucking delicious. 
So don't stress too much about that. All right, so I'm just gonna lightly flour both sides of this before I go. Um, it's actually a really nice smooth looking dough. Yeah, I'm quite happy with it, I must say. So both sides, massage it in so it's nice and, and then we're literally just gonna roll. It doesn't have to be any particular shape. If it does stick to your rolling pin, flip it over. If it's sticking on both sides, a bit more flour. Just be very, very, very gentle with the amount of flour you use because obviously you don't want to over flour it because that'll create a tough dough and then everybody will cry. <laughs> so keep on keep on rolling, 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 what? Keep rolling, 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 rolling. <laughs> Can you tell he used to be a pizza chef? No. It wasn't uh, obvious at all. Your dough looks like Australia, but flat, without... Yeah, well, you know. Without Tasmania. <laughs> Tasmania, fuck Tasmania. <laughs> so, just keep... Working it, working it, working it. As you can see, we're getting to a nice, just this corner is a bit thick. <laughs> and although we like them thick, especially with three C's. Oh my God. <laughs> Looks like a car now. This end a little bit more. Is it meant to be any particular shape? No, it is not meant to be because we're going to use um, a cookie cutter or right. a knife if you've only got that right. or whatever to cut the shapes out. Gotcha. So now as you can see, we're basically where we want to be. We may need to roll it out a little bit more, but I'm pretty happy with that. Okay, so for the pastille, now we're all rolled out. I've chosen my cookie cutter. I don't have cookie cutters available here at home. They're, I've left them at work. So this is how I'm gonna make my dough. Feel free, again, when cutting, whatever you have access to, mugs, glasses, bowls, like this one, etc. Anything that will give you a circular shape. If you don't even have access to that, a knife, and just cut nice rectangular pieces, and yours will be a slightly different shape, but they'll still taste the same, and you'll still be able to achieve what we're trying to achieve today. Okay, come over this way to the stove top. So I've shifted the chicken to the back burner, which is a slightly less uh, powerful burner, so I've popped a lid on, okay? Just to make sure that it still maintains a good temperature. Here, I have a pot that has oil in it. Now, I have a deep fryer that I could have got out and I could have put the oil in there. But, I figured most people who are watching this probably don't have access to a deep fryer. So literally, I've taken this pan, I've half filled it with rice bran oil, use any high temperature oil, please try to avoid using olive oil, and basically you're going to heat it to a point where it's not smoking, but when you put something in there, you get a nice sizzle. Oh, do you know a good tip for that? Put the end of a wooden spoon in, and when it rapidly bubbles, it's ready to go. There you go. So you just dip the end of your wooden spoon in, or if you don't have access to that, uh, a piece of flour, some salt, whatever, if it's shh, you're good to go. So that's heating. I will uh, obviously drop the temperature on that once we get uh, up, but I'm just trying to bring it up right now. So, back over here, I'm going to take my awesome uh, chef quality cookie cutter. <laughs> and basically, all we're going to do is that. So we've got some circles. That's it. That's, that's all you want to do is you want to make circles and then you roll your dough up and you roll it out again. And you just go and go and go and go and go until you have all your circles. Now, I highly recommend flowering your circles as you go so that you don't have them stick to the bench, you don't have them stick to each other. Then, once you have all your circles rolled out, we'll go through the filling process. Okay, so as you can see, we now have our circular uh, pieces of pastel dough rolled out. Now, I have some leftover dough. We've already rolled this out and, and uh, put the circle shapes and all that out of it 
uh, two or three times, it's starting to get a bit stiff. So the best piece of information I can give you when you get to this point and it feels like it's really hard to roll out, put all your leftover pieces together, cling film it, let it rest in your fridge. If you're not going to use it straight away, put it in your freezer for another time. Or if you've got time on your site, just put it off to the side and let it rest and relax again because every time you screw, sorry, you scrunch it up, roll it out, scrunch it up, roll it out, etc., you're activating the gluten in the dough more and more and more and it's going to get tougher and tougher and tougher so you need to let it rest. So feel free to do it all, but I am saying there is an option if you would like to continue at a later point and you can put any sort of filling in these as well that you desire. Today we're doing cheese because it's the traditional thing. You can put mint, you can put veggies, you can put anything that your heart desires in there. And if you do have leftover dough, that enables you, I don't know, in a future dinner or whatever, to go, oh yeah, I've got that dough and I've got some mints, you know, and you put some mints in there and you do some little deep fried minty things. Anyway, if you'd like to come this way. So, as I spoke about before, we have the oil. I also have a plate with paper towel, this is for draining, and I have a slotted spoon. If you don't have a slotted spoon, tongs. If you don't have tongs, a spoon. Anything that stops you from actually having to put your hand in the oil, because obviously- the Do oil not do that. Is super, super hot. We're talking nearly 200 degrees Celsius here. So as you can see, if you come closer, I will pop the end of this spoon in there and see how it starts to foam and bubble. That means my oil is ready for cooking it. So now what we'll do is we'll come over here and we'll make some doughs. Okay, so now we have, I'm going to demonstrate five of these because otherwise we'll be here for 1100 years whilst I do them all and cook them all for you. <laughs> um, so I've got five pieces laid out. I've got my cheese. I've got lactose free. I'm a lactar. <laughs> you know, um, if, you, if you're vegan, feel free to use plant-based. If you want to use normal cheese, go for it. If you don't like cheese, use another filling. Put whatever you like in here. We're just doing cheese because that is the traditional filling. So, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some cheese, I'm going to break it up a little bit, and I'm going to pop it on one side or as close as possible to one side of the dough. And you do want to put a fair bit, almost to the point where you think, oh yeah, that's a lot, I'm not sure that's going to close. But, it will. Then, you want to dip your finger in some water, and just line the rim of the dough. This is just going to help with the sticking process when you do fold it over. And then, you want to make sure that you have no overhanging bits, and try and push it all to the centre. If, for your first few, if you have a little bit less filling whilst you're getting used to the whole technique of folding over, that's fine because you'll get more and more confident as you go along and later on your ones will be very full and very cheesy. So, all I'm going to do now is fold that over, stick it down around the edges. The water will help massively with this part including actually making it stick to my fingers as well. <laughs> and you just wanted to get it to that point. And then, you grab your trusty little forking device, <laughs> and you crimp around the sides until you almost have like a ravioli style looking thing. And then to be doubly sure, and you don't have to do this, but I am doing this, Crimp the other side as well. And this will basically guarantee that you don't get a burst. And then, all I'll do is I'll make sure my surface is a little bit floured, and that's a little bit floured, because I just don't want it to stick now that it is in such a thin, and that will also help to create an even uh, crispier exterior. And then, just repeat the process. Now, if you do find fiddly things a little bit difficult, you can first put water around the edges. You can choose not to use water at all if you really trust your ability to just crimp using the fork in your fingers. So I will now demonstrate one for you where I do the water around the edge first. 
like so. Dry it up. Grab your cheese. It doesn't matter what cheese or whatever you've picked, as long as it's your favourite, as long as it uh, melts. Those are the prerequisites to this dish. Pop it in. Nice pile. Hold it together. Go over on the fold. Remove the pieces that might uh, act as if they're not going to fit. Da 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 da. Round the edge, etc. It's all nicely stuck down. Grab the forking device. Crimp it around. You don't have to flip it over. I want to reiterate, you don't have to flip it over and crimp on the other side. That's just my personal preference. Just going to pause for a uh, sec there to say uh, two points that I need to just make is A, I only ended up actually pre-making three of them um, in the video simply because after I'd made three, I went, oh yeah, there's no other different way to do this. So there's no point demonstrating any other ways to do it. And the second part is I used grated cheese because that's the only lactose free cheese they had at the shops. I recommend using block cheese or cheese cubes or something with a bit more um, heft to it uh, to achieve a better end result. Just to make sure that we don't get any bursting during the cooking process. Right, second one. Dust it in a little bit of flour to make sure that it doesn't stick. Right, this next one that I'm going to do, I'm just going to brush the bottom of it in a little bit of flour because it was starting to become a bit sticky on the bench. Just obviously monitor that. If you do notice they're becoming a bit sticky, just any of the flour that's already on the bench, just wipe it through. You won't have any sticking problems anymore. This one I'm going to do without water. So same idea, we just haven't done any edge work and we will not do any edge work. Like so. A bit more. Then hold the pile, come over the top. Uh, Black Evo, yeah, I do recommend um, pre-cooking if you're using a meat filling. However, if you are using uh, beef or, you know, obviously it doesn't matter so much because you can eat beef rare, blue, medium rare, etc. But obviously if you are using a filling like chicken or something like that, yeah, I highly recommend pre-cooking before you put it in. Stick it down. It require a little bit more sticking because you haven't used the um, water to stick. You can use oil. You can use um, a milk as well with the sticking process. The milk may provide uh, more flavour. That's your call. It's not the traditional way. I'm not even sure this is the traditional way, but what this does is it achieves close to the traditional street food, and that's what we're aiming. And then I'll just dust it in some of the excess flour that's on the bench. Okay, so now it's time to cook these. So I'm just going to cook three at the moment, and then I'll go through and I'll do behind the scenes later on. So this is the one that hasn't had any water to hold the edges down. So basically what you want to do is you want to hold it till you get that nice bubbling. And then just gently drop it, being very careful of your fingers, obviously. Then we have the two watered ones. This is the one that we watered before we put filling in. This is the one that we watered after we put filling in. Is there going to be any difference? Probably not. Put that in. And in. Now my oil is slightly higher temperature, so I've just dropped. And the oil temperature will drop as well with the um, addition of the still in and then just use your spoon to help guide it around the oil making sure that they don't connect to each other they don't stick etc if you'd like to come and uh, 
So as you can see, they're starting to go golden already. You will need to continuously uh, flip them around to make sure that the cooking process is even. And they will go very golden and they will become extremely crispy. So this is what they look like after they've come out of the oil. A beautiful golden, there's a little bit of uh, cheese that has leaked out and it's become this beautiful crispy golden as well. But as you can see, it's just golden all over. Nice and puffed so up, good. plenty of bubbles. The oil is now drained off. Okay, so at this point your kitchen's probably gonna look a little bit messy because you're gonna be doing So before I continue on to the next uh, part of the video, which is going to be the Koshinya, um, does anybody else have any questions in relation to the pastel? And yeah, that's basically all I wanted to ask, I think. <laughs> hey, Fozzy! Welcome to the stream. You thought you smelt something cooking? Well, your nose took you in the right direction there, mate. Will I deliver to the UK? Um, <laughs> I mean, unless Concord's coming back into service with Uber Eats, probably not. Hey, but Bubba, take away from flower drum. That's delicious. So good, bro. So, all right, I'll uh, continue playing the video. I will be, personally, I will be right back in about two minutes, but I'll keep the video playing. Two jobs at once because we're in the process of filling the pastel. We also need to get the chicken out of the uh, liquid. We need to uh, pull that chicken. So, it comes off. Be careful when transferring across to the washing area. And then our chicken breast comes out. And what we want to do is we want to just use the tongs to shred that chicken up. Doesn't have to be perfect. If you don't have tongs, you could use two forks yep. to pull it. You can use forks. You can uh, put some gloves on and do it with your fingers if you've got really good um, heat sensitive fingers. So basically, you just want to work at it for a couple of minutes with whatever device you're using until you have a beautiful shredded chicken breast. It should be nice and moist, like this one is. It shouldn't require any effort other than the movement of the fork or the tongs or whatever to create this. This didn't require any force or effort from me, just literally the process of moving like this. There we go. We have a beautiful shredded chicken breast. So you wanna just put that off to the side and you want to let that uh, cool down a little bit so you can get to the point where you can handle it. Now, we're going to make the dough that this chicken breast gets added to. But before we do that, to allow it to come up to temperature a little bit, we're going to finish filling the pastel. We're going to cook them. And that job will be done. Okay, so now for the uh, cochinia, now that we've done the pastel, we need to uh, continue the uh, crushing. So, you want to get yourself a pot, relatively deep, doesn't matter what size, as long as it can handle a litre of chicken stock. So I know for a fact that this can. If you've got something bigger, great. If you've got something smaller that holds a litre of chicken stock, fantastic. Whatever one. Now, I've been a cheap ass and a lazy ass. I've purchased chicken stock. Haven't gone ahead and make it. If you've got some in your freezer that you've made, use that. If you want to purchase chicken style stock or, you know, whatever. If you just literally want to use stock cubes with a bit of water, go for that. So I'm going to empty this into the... Um, uh, what was I... 
What did I get up to? Oh, yes. Uh, no worries, Bubba. See you tomorrow evening. Sorry, I'm just uh, catching up on uh, what I missed. Uh, yeah, Black Evo, uh, 30 minutes-ish. You just want to have a nice, moist, easy-to-pull chicken, basically. Um, if it's cooked in 20 minutes, obviously take it out after 20. But yeah, 30 minutes, you're pretty safe. Hot. Get out of there. There we go. That's that. We're all stocked up. Then I'm going to throw in some salt. Again. These are going to be chef bits of salt. I will give you a... Obviously, you guys know the exact measurements from the recipe, but I will obviously give you those as well. Uh, hello. Can I have open? So, it asks for one teaspoon of paprika. Again, I'm just going to go chefy. That's about a teaspoon of paprika. And then two tablespoons of butter if I can get into the butter. And again, I'm going to be chefy here. Really can't get into this butter. There we go, finally managed to open the damn thing. Always clean as you go. So to me, that's about two tablespoons of butter. Again, please do follow the recipe for your guys' benefits. Everything that we need in the pot, we're taking the pot, and we're going to be starting something, because you want to be starting something. You've got to be starting something. It's <laughs> hard to get all the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that didn't sound great. Basically, you want to um, place that on a burner, and you want to bring it up to the boil. That is the aim of that. All right, so now we need to uh, sift our flour for the dough that's currently on the stove. So, take the rest of my flour. As you can see here, I've got a bowl with a sieve and a scale. I'm gonna turn the scale on. And I'm gonna go for 500 grams of sifted flour. You may need to use a spoon to help it go through the... Uh, the sieve? Sieve. And make a bit of a mess while you're doing so. Absolutely. What's cooking without mess? So obviously you can't read the scale whilst you're putting pressure on the scale. That would be, you know, common sense. So when I let go of this, then we'll know how many grams of flour we are at. So 140, 150 grams so far. So we need to get to 500, so we've got a long way to go. It's a long way to the top. If you want to make dough. That brings us to 375 grams. I'm feeling very sifty. Swifty? No, shifty. Swifty? Thrifty? Swifty. Car and truck rental? Rick and Morty reference. Rick and Morty. This is, as you can see, a little bit of a tedious process, but I uh, wanted to make sure that everyone knows exactly what they have to do. So now we've got uh, 375 grams of flour. We'll do our next. Some for the bench. There we go, 500 grams. Make sure that's beautifully sifted in as well. And the little bit of flour that's on the bench is not necessarily a problem because we're going to have to flour and butter the bench for making the dough. So you can just leave that there. There we go. Sifted flour, 500 grams. As you can see, 
Okay, so now we're going to butter and flour our surface that we're going to be making this dough on. So I'm going to just cut off a very small bit of butter. The, um, the recipe will obviously state the exact amount for those of you who are following along, but again, I'm just going to be chefy. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to use the temperature in my hands. going to smush it around on the surface. Might need a little bit more than that. And then onto that, we're going to add our flour. And basically, because the dough we're going to be making is quite wet, because it's uh, almost a croquette or arancini style um, item that we are producing here, we need that uh, surface area between it and the bench to avoid sticking and potentially losing um, product and all that. So as you can see, I've got a nice uh, layer of butter now on the bench. Oh, there's a little bit more there, so I'll just use that as well, like so. And then simply on top of that, I'm going to sprinkle it doesn't matter what flour it is really, even if uh, you've only got a little bit of corn flour or whatever, this is just literally a pantry staple, just dust the area, and then that is it. That is ready for us to put our dough on. Okay, so now as you can see, our liquid that we put on the stove to boil is now in fact boiling. So we're going to just drop the temperature a little bit to just bring that boil back down a little bit. Then we're going to come over here with a wooden spoon, put our bowl of sifted flour. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to add this sifted flour to that liquid. Now you can go all in one go, however to make your job easier I recommend at least at the start doing it a little bit gradually first. Just until you start to get an idea of what, um, because it's going to become progressively harder and harder and harder and stickier. So we need to you know, like most Saturday nights, I guess, when it becomes harder and stickier. Yeah. So I'm going to go in with about that much to start with. And now it is just literally... Fozzie, I figured for the benefit of everyone's eyes that I wouldn't actually do this naked, though. It's really a process of just mix, 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 mix. Try not to flick yourself with the hot liquid. And it will be hot and it will be steamy. And you will, so just be aware of that. And now we're just, yeah, literally this is the, and we just wanna go until it passes the sticky stage and becomes a hard uh, stage. You just want to peel it off of the sides and keep going and going and going and going. Don't be scared to play with your temperature if you feel like it's getting away from you. So this is oh, getting quite difficult. And you want it, as I said, you want to go until it's no longer sticky. So it may take quite a bit of effort my god that is quite hard it's um smell good it smells, it smells good. fantastic but it is very very difficult and you'll notice that as it gets harder it peels away from the edge more if you are ever planning on cooking naked i can um vouch from experience don't don't deep fry things when naked or at least cover the uh, location down below because hot oil down there is, um, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you're glad you're in VR, Vruden. Yep. I don't blame you there. Hot tub cooking stream. Hmm. There's an idea. Hot tub cooking stream. Yes. Black Evo. Or yeah. Don't use chili and then forget to wash your hands. That's another good tip.
I make no comment about what I was doing or how I know. I just providing this uh, service. I'm just going to check in the sim that I'm not going to run into anything. No, no, we good, we good. Okay, cool. I might uh, just keep it facing that way for a bit now. I, uh, I need to figure out a slightly better way to get this player into here. I didn't uh, actually make it a source in my Streamlabs. I should have. But uh, no, that's cool. That's, that's something for me to do for the next cookie on the fly. All right, back to the video. And more and more. But you can still see that there's bits of flour in there that are not combined. So you just want to keep on going. That's looking better. So as you can see now, it's basically peeled away from the pot. And it is almost not sticky. So we're still going to have to work this on the surface that we made before. But you want to try and get as much of it combined as you possibly can in the pot. It looks like a ball of dough now. So as you can see now it is definitely looking like dough. But we just need to keep going and going and going until it no longer sticks to the spoon as well. And you also want to make sure that you're cooking out the taste of the flour. Because nothing worse than uh, the taste of flour that hasn't been cooked out properly. If you don't go to the gym, you're going to have massive biceps by the end of this. It is one hell of a workout. You know it's a difficult um, workout when even a chef is struggling to, uh, somebody who uses spoons regularly is struck. So as you can see, not sticky at all. Not sticking to my hands. I personally don't recommend you do that for too long because that is quite hot and you will burn yourself. But, as you can see, no stick whatsoever. So I'm turning the heat off now. That gives you a general idea of what you're looking for with the dough. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so now I've upturned the dough onto that buttered and floured surface that we made. Basically, you wanna just press it out nice and flat so that it starts to cool down. You can see the steam rising as I flatten it out more and more and more. And of course what that's doing as well is it's melting the butter that we put on the bench and that's creating that surface between uh, the dough and the bench. So the flatter you get it, the quicker it will cool down. But you obviously don't want to exceed your um, surface that you made with the butter and flour at the same time because you'll have a really rough time trying to remove it. There we go, I'm pretty happy with that. Now, the next part we need to do is the Brazilian sofrito. So this is the, for the filling for the coxinha. Now, the recipe states for two onions. You can use brown onion, white onion, red onion, whatever you have access to. Spring onion, if that's your preference. When it comes to onions, my preference is leeks. So I've chosen to be a chefy prick again, and I'm gonna use leek. Please, if you are following along and you wanna follow the recipe to a T, please follow it to a T. This is just me making personal preferences. I like the sweetness and the flavor that leek imparts when it's sauteed with garlic and all that. Yeah, so basically, I am going to half of that. I'm going to make sure that there's uh, no butter on my handle before I go and uh, <laughs> slice because, well, at least there would be video evidence of how I lost my fingers. <laughs> but I don't really want to do that today. So I'm just using my, um, so this tea towel is just my wipe things down tea towel as long as it's not like raw meat or whatever because that would be pretty um 
screwed up. Now if you are using leaf, just make sure you check the inner parts for any dirt. And we good, we good. So, and then I'm just going to slice it up. Now if you're doing onions, best, uh, like you can slice it however you want. Obviously the bigger you slice it, the longer the sofrito uh, and cooking down of the onions is going to take. The finer you slice it, the less time it's going to take. If you're good enough to do the cubes, where you run the knife down and then through, G'day Dan Random. Yes, this is live. I had many, many issues earlier today and I should have seen the light and I should have originally done it at this time. But um, here I am fixing that up and doing it live. So uh, feel free to just sit back, relax, grab a beer. I've grabbed a beer even though you guys can't currently see that. And uh, watch along. The cooking, however, is not live. The cooking is pre-recorded. Um... However, this is very much motivating me to set up my man cave with like a sort of trestle kitchen setup um, with electric stovetops and all that so that I can also do literal cook along live sessions. All right, now uh, back to the video. And then, or if you want to just run a knife over like that, once you slice the onion up, Basically, it's your prerogative on how you do this. Just obvious, and it also comes down to your knife skills as well. Everybody does this uh, in their own personal way. This is just uh, me giving you a few tips and tricks on how to make your life a bit easier. Obviously, when we are showing this um, recipe live, I will be able to stop for those who haven't been able to cut their onions so fine and do need that little bit of extra cooking time. So do not stress if you can't And there we go, there's my uh, leek. So I'm just gonna pop that in this bowl. And that's probably about the equivalent of two normal sized brown onions that you would get from your uh, local supermarket or green grocer or whatever. If your onions are bigger, feel free to use one. If you want extra onion, use two big onions. This recipe really is uh, as much in your control as it is in my control. You can uh, alter things to suit your taste or to suit your wants. As you've noticed where I've been adding a little bit of extra salt, a little bit of extra this, not measuring that, etc. Because I know what my tongue likes. Okay, so now we're going to cook the onion and the garlic, or in my case, the leek and the garlic. So, we're going to want a medium heat. So that, I would say that's about a medium heat on that particular burner. But if you feel like you uh, would be happier cooking at a lower heat, please do cook at a lower heat. What we're going for here is translucent onion or whatever particular item you're using. If you are using spring onions, please cook at a lower heat because they cook extremely fast. Okay? So now, I'm going to come over here. I'm going to let that heat up for a little bit. I'm going to get my garlic together. I just want to also point out something I didn't point out in the uh, video. If you are allergic to onion or um, fructose or whatever, please, please, please uh, use something like celery. Celery does not have um, like that. That will provide a similar flavor, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Garlic, I don't really have a... Uh, Secondary option, um, you could always just do a bit of uh, celery and really finely chopped carrot. Um, that, you know, do a uh, Italian sofrito instead of a Brazilian sofrito. But, um, yeah. And Drew, welcome to the stream, mate. I So you'll watch with the missus and cook later? Not a problem. I, I'm assuming a lot of people who are watching this are probably going to cook it later. Um, cooking on the fly number two. If I can get some uh, equipment like a trestle table and all that out here in this uh, man cave, I'm hoping that occasionally I'll also be able to cook along physically live with you guys as well as doing pre-recordings. But um, for now, let's uh, head back to that video. 
as well. Now, the recipe states for three garlic cloves. I already just have minced garlic in a jar, usually. Um, so I'm just going to use that because it uh, saves time, etc. Why can't I get the lid off? I can get the lid off. Um, I really like garlic. Three cloves of garlic would probably be about a tablespoon of that. I'm going to put two tablespoons. That's just personal preference. Again, if you are wanting to follow the recipe to a T, please do follow the recipe to a T. So I'm going to roll that, on that onion. I'm going to roll that onion around the pan. I'm going to roll that oil around the pan. And then bang, in with my legs. Now, it should just be, at this point, because we're not looking for serious colour, we're just looking for translucency, you should just hear a slight sizzle sound. You don't want to hear, you know, psh, you don't want to have oil and shit going everywhere and all that. You just want a nice background and then I'm going to add my two shit tons of garlic. Shit tons of garlic. <laughs> That's exactly right. Look at that. Look at that. I want to keep... Garlic is not something you measure with your head. Garlic is something you measure with your heart. That's my um, thought process anyway. Holy oh, shit. <laughs> and then I will personally, I'll use a spatula for this. Again, whatever utensil you have to mix this around is perfectly acceptable. And then literally, as I said, we want to cook this at this medium heat, moving it around the pan until the onion goes translucent or the leek goes translucent or you get a bit of colour on your spring onions or whatever you've uh, elected to use. I must say it is smelling fantastic in here right now. Onion and garlic smells so good. Mm. Making sure we keep those fucking vampires away as well with the amount of garlic that we're using. I would like to apologise for your to your audience because my videoing skills are horrific. So yeah, now we just want to let that cook nice and slowly. We'll come back to you when that's uh, become translucent with the next step. Just have a quick look. It's friggin' good. Yeah. So now, as you can see, the dough is gross because you just fingered it. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is the dough is now cold. Not cold, but it is more than able to just have your hands there, no problem. And that's the benefit of spreading it out the way you have. It also tastes really good because yeah, I just a picked of some off and tasted so it. So if you come so. over here, it's really good. And this smells like heaven. As you can see, the leek has started to become that translucent colour. There's a little bit of colour starting to form on it. We don't want to probably go any further with it. It smells bloody phenomenal, all this garlic and leek, I must say. It really does. So now we're going to drop the temperature right down. And at this point, the chicken that we pour goes in. So shredded chicken. Yum. In with it. And then straight away, before we mix anything, we want to throw in a tablespoon of paprika. Whether you have Hungarian, smoky, sweet, hot. Obviously, if you have hot paprika, probably don't add a tablespoon. <laughs> it's going to be a little bit, unless you really like fire. I'm not going to measure this. I'm just going to... Okay, so that looks like a tablespoon of paprika in my chef mind. I haven't measured it. Now, we sort of mix that... <laughs> together looks so good once it's all uh, sort of the red color of paprika then we're going to season with salt and pepper now this part of the recipe is salt and pepper to taste so if you're not sure of your taste add less and you can add more at a later point as you taste along the way and tasting along the way is extremely important I do know my tastes so I'm going to season so, he likes it as salty as the Dead Sea. I don't quite like it that salty. So, we're going to give a good crack of pepper because I like a good uh, peppery kick. And we're going to give a good, decent pinch of salt. 
Or a handful. It's not a handful. <laughs> like so. And then we're just going to mix that again until it's combined. And there's no like uh, scratchiness of the salt as it's all dissolved into the food. Whoops, we're losing some off the edge. <laughs> I'm on the edge of glory. <laughs> And there we go, that's your uh, onion and garlic sofrito or Brazilian sofrito or whatever you want to uh, call it. So that's a general idea of what it should look color wise and texture wise. Okay, so now that we've got that done, we have to remove from the heat and this is where we add the parsley. So take, I've just got a lightly dried, already pre-cut parsley because there was no parsley, uh, fresh parsley in stock at the shops, bang. 15 grams parsley straight in. Um, Black Evo, I have a whole um, array of salts in my pantry. I obviously have just basic table salt. I have molten sea salt flakes. I have um, pink salt. I have smoked chili salt. I have uh, garlic salt. I have chicken salt. I have... So many salts that you could uh, take me to jail for assault, basically. Then, we want to mix that together. Obviously, fresh parsley is good. Absolutely. Um. If you can source fresh parsley, fantastic. If you source lightly dried parsley, Awesome. If all you can get is dried parsley flakes like that, that's fine as well. They will all impart the uh, general flavor of what you are looking for. So now that that is all mixed through, we just pop that off to the side and we're going to go back to our dough. All right, so now that the dough is basically cold to the touch, we can now work it into a proper dough because right now it doesn't Honestly, it doesn't look like a dough, really, does it? So, you want to bring it together, you want to knead it until it looks. Um, Black Evo, I, in a perfect world, I would love to use molten sea salt flakes in all of my cooking, but we don't live in a perfect world. Um, so, I usually just use table salt in my home cooking just a decent quality table salt not just your basic everyday um you know Woolworths home brand stuff I make sure it's you know at least more than 50 cents for a kilo or whatever that that stuff costs um yeah yeah exactly right black um a pinch of table salt is different to a pinch of salt flakes um that's probably why when I say a pinch, you'll see me adding a little bit more than what one would possibly consider a pinch. Uh, that's simply because I am obviously used to using salt flakes. Like a dough. Shouldn't be too difficult. It's, uh, it comes together pretty easy. There's still be a little bit of warmth in there, but that's okay. So you just want to go until you have a nice smooth dough that is together and doesn't want to come apart. So as you can see, that is a nice smooth combined dough. And that took me, what, all of 30 seconds to get to that point. All right, so in the meantime, I've just popped my oil on. Don't have to worry too much about that. You can do that right now. You can save that for later. We're in no rush here. So I'm going to take, just to make my life a bit easier, I'm going to take my um, mix. I'm going to put it into the bowl that I had the chicken shredded in. And this is just so I can add the cream cheese a little bit easier than trying to do it in a uh, pan. You don't have to do it this way if you've got a good, um, nice high-edge fry pan or a large fry pan that you use. Feel free to do it in there. 
And to that, I'm gonna add my 285 grams of softened cream cheese. Now this is lactose free cream cheese, just for me. Feel free to add whatever cream cheese that you have. And if it's not 100% soft, the good news is the residual heat from within the mix itself will help to soften and melt the cream cheese. And if it's a little bit stuck to your spatula, well, you're gonna be using the spatula to mix it through. So it will come off with the residual heat. And then we are literally just gonna do mix, mix, mix until it is all combined. And we'll come back to you when we have the correct consistency. Okay, so now we're gonna assemble our cochinia. So I've popped a plate here to put the assembled cochinia on. So the first thing you wanna do is you wanna grab a golf ball-ish sized dough. So as you can see, and you wanna roll it around in your hands until you get a nice ball shape. Like so, nice and smooth, okay? Then you wanna flatten it out you want to have it slightly more indented in the middle in your hand, like so. Then you take a teaspoon of your mix and you pop it in. I might put a tiny bit more. And then just make sure it's nice in the middle. There we go. And then you literally want to fold to a TP style this this part is a little bit fiddly and it may take a little bit of time for you to get your first few correct don't worry they're still going to taste freaking awesome and it's not like this is for a restaurant, but that's sort of what you're looking for. This one might be a little bit on the bigger side, but it gives you a general idea of what you're looking for. Don't be scared to work the edges and work it up to the top to create the pinch at the top to give you that teardrop or tea bag sort of uh, look. And that's what you're looking for. And it's simple as that. Place that on the plate, grab another golf ball piece, roll it up, flatten it out, Put your teaspoon, teaspoon and a bit of filling in, put it on the plate. And you just do that until you have no more dough or no more filling left. Like the pastel dough, any leftover, you can wrap it up, you can freeze it, you can fridge it, you can use it at a different point. You can obviously make a completely different filling for it. So for demonstration purposes, I've only done two so far, okay? Because I just want to show you guys the rest of the steps before I go back and do them uh, on my own, basically. So, in one bowl, you want to put one egg. So I'm going to break that egg into the bowl. I must say, Brett, um, you make a good point. The Italian blood within me is very, 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 very um, obvious when watching me cook. There's a lot of hand involvements in the way I speak and, you know, say that this must be done this way and that must be done that way. You can definitely tell that I uh, have some of Northern Italian blood in me. Like so. Then you want to take a fork or a whisk or whatever you want to use and you want to whisk that egg. Remember, aggravated assault for beating eggs life in prison. <laughs> then you want to add 500 mils of milk. I've gone for milkish oat just because I'm lactose intolerant and I don't like the flavor that lactose free milk imparts. Use whatever milk you want. You are literally doing this to create a liquid. I'm just going to uh, make sure I shake this up like the instructions say, because I've just opened it. Now you want your milk to be room temperature or as close to room temperature as you can possibly get. So if you're using a big bottle, I recommend decanting some into another utensil to allow you to um, let it come up without potentially spoiling the rest of your liquid. So anyway, it says 500 mils. This is a one liter bottle. 
I'm just going to go until I feel as if there's enough liquid. Alright, I'm pretty happy with that. Then to that, I'm going to add some salt. Now again, this is salt to taste. The best piece of advice I can offer you is that if you haven't seasoned enough, you can season once you've cooked in oil. So I'm going to put a little bit of salt in here, like so. I'm going to mix it all together so that the egg and the milk combines. There we go. As you can see, there's no uh, differentiating now between the milk and the egg. And then into this next bowl, I'm going to add breadcrumbs. I've chosen panko breadcrumbs just because I like the texture of a thicker breadcrumb. If you've got normal everyday breadcrumbs, fine. If you don't have breadcrumbs, if you've got bread in the freezer or some stale bread, literally put it in a blender, chop it up finely, whatever you want to do. As long as you can get sort of a bread texture on the outside, that's all you're looking for. You so can I'm even going. toast a piece of fresh bread and then exactly. blend it. Exactly. Toast a piece of fresh bread, blend it up, cut it up with a knife, whatever works for you. So to that, I'm also going to add some salt. And just for my personal preference and a bit of colorization, I'm adding a small dusting of paprika. You do not have to do that. The recipe does not state it. And then I'm gonna take just any spoon, and it doesn't matter, you can even use your fingers for this. I'm just gonna literally bring it together until it looks like the paprika has sort of uh, slightly colored the breadcrumbs. That's all I'm looking for. Now, at this point, you can go ahead and you can crumb all your kashinya and you can decide not to cook them and you can freeze them and you can cook them at a later point if you would like. You can also cook them and then you can freeze them and cook them in the oven at a later point. It is uh, purely up to you what you would like to do. As I said, I'm just doing two right now for demonstration purposes and I'm sending breadcrumbs everywhere in the process because I'm not focusing on what I'm doing and I'm talking to you guys. <laughs> so, thumbs up for the chef right there. <laughs> Right, so literally all we are doing is we are taking your koshinya. Now, you do want to have it as closed as you possibly can. However, if you do not have a perfect seal, you are about to place it in crumbs, which will create a seal. So basically, you want to use one hand for the wet, one hand for the dry, so that you don't end up with PVA glue <laughs> on the end of your fingers. And you just want to coat it in the liquid, Shake off any excess, drop it into the crumbs, and just make sure that it is nicely coated in the crumbs. If you feel like it's not coating the way you want, you can do a double crumbing method, where you can, now that it's crumbed, you can drop it back into the uh, liquid, and then you can drop it back into the crumbs. You don't have to do that. Again, that is a personal preference. I will do one like this, and I will do one double crumb. And we will see if there is any difference in the result. Honestly, the only difference should be is that the exterior will be a little bit crummier. That's it. So shake off the excess. Now, spend time with your uh, koshinya. Don't be afraid to make love to the outside. <laughs> Get your fingers in there. Show it that... Uh, you know, it means a lot to you. <laughs> so this one's going to be the one that we double crumb. So I'm going to roll it around in the liquid. Again, shake off any excess, transfer back to the crumbs. And we're going to crumb again. And it's always important that you crumb again and again and again. Really? Uh, For fuck's sake. It's the secret to a healthy relationship. There's plenty of crumbing. Oh my god. Right, so as you can see, not much difference between the two. But you can tell that one has more crumbs on the outside than the other. Now, if you've seasoned your crumbs as liberally as I have, you will notice that having a double crumb on the outside will impart, obviously, more flavour. Now, whether or not this needs more flavour is um, up for debate, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> 
But um, now we just need to fry these. So I'll meet you over at the stove soon with the oil and we'll fry them. So now it comes time to the frying part. Now if you haven't put your oil on yet, that's not a problem. You don't need to worry about them sitting there whilst your oil comes up to temperature, etc. Don't stress about that. I did put my oil on. I've done the end of the wooden spoon test how I showed you with the pastel. Now we're ready to fry. You don't want to go too high of a temperature, you just want a small bubbles to surround the outside of the wooden spoon because you need to cook these for four to five minutes. And you don't want the outside to go golden too quickly and you don't want the inside to still be raw. You want a nice uh, cooked style item. So, in my left hand is the single crumb, in my right hand is the double crumb. We're going to drop into the oil. Gently. Very, very gently. If you're not confident about putting your hand this close to hot oil, please use a slotted spoon, use tongs, whatever. Now, you will need to move this around unless you are using a deep fryer, in which case you shouldn't have an issue. So there we go. And what I'll do is I will just continuously roll this around so that the whole cochinha is cooked for the next four to five minutes. And then we will remove, we'll place on a plate with paper towel to soak up, soak up any excess oil. And again, the chef in me says a little bit of extra salt. This is the point where you should test your first one to see if the seasoning is correct. If it is, obviously, you don't season it once you come out of the oil. If you do, season them straight away as soon as you take them out of the oil, because the hot oil in the exterior will cause the salt to uh, become part of the uh, dough and provide a better seasoning. So we'll come back to you in about four to five minutes when these are ready to be uh, removed. They look bloody brilliant. Alright, so the uh, cochinha, as you can see, nice and golden brown on the outside now. So I'm going to remove with the slotted spoon. If you've got tongs, tongs, if you don't have any of those things, well, you're just going to have a little bit of excess oil that's being transferred across. Look at that now, crispness. Oh. The double crumb, obviously slightly crispier on the outside. Again, that's just a personal preference. The recipe doesn't state that you need to double crumb, but I just thought I'd do one for uh, people to have a look. And there you go. So that's your double crumb, that's your single crumb. Not much difference really, as you can see.
And just like that, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of the cooking demonstration. Um, obviously, I did uh, sort that out in the thought process of I would have people cooking along. Obviously, things have occurred that uh, didn't make that a thing this time around. But now people know uh, exactly what I'm presenting, how I'm presenting, how I go about it. So hopefully that... Um, gives more people confidence next time around to join in the cooking. Because um, I'd absolutely love to be able to have people cooking along whilst uh, we're doing these uh, flights. And as I said, I will set up a kitchen here in the uh, man cave area as well so that I can do some of the more basic dishes uh, live on stream. But, um... An interesting point that I would like to make um, is that because of all the uh, fact that Regional Victoria came out of lockdown, then I postponed the stream for a week, went on holidays and came back, I never actually practiced those dishes. So those, you seeing me cook there live on camera was the first time I have ever, ever, ever cooked those items in my life. So... I'm pretty happy with how it went, considering that that was the uh, scenario. But um, if anyone has any questions um, about the taste or whatever, um, I still have pastel dough in my freezer. Um, I'm going to use it to make Nutella and strawberry deep fried um, pastel, etc. So. Um, so the flavour of the pastel, well, it was cheese. It was deep fried pastry with cheese. That's the best way to describe it. I mean, you cannot go wrong. Um, the cochinha was next level. To have a paprika and chicken stock infused dough that was then filled with shit tons of garlic and leek and chicken was just... If you're only going to pick um, one of the dishes that I've cooked, I recommend the cochinha. I recommend the pastel dough. Um, and I recommend doing a few of those if you are interested, but I recommend also experimenting with that dough because it's an extremely versatile dough. Um, yeah. But, um... Yeah, if anyone has any questions for the rest of the stream, um, please, please, please do ask. I will see if I can find the photos that I popped on my um, computer of the full-on completed products. Alright, so there's uh, the plate of finished pastel. As you can see, they look absolutely insane. And I'll tell you right now, they tasted bloody awesome. And then... There's the uh, cooked cochinha. And there we go. That was... Uh Brazil's two most famous street foods. So um, I do hope that everybody did enjoy that and I do hope that everybody does enjoy cooking along with that. Um, I do want to just have some feedback from you guys. Where can I improve? Um, do you like that uh, long cooking demonstration process? Would you prefer a smaller um, process on the actual cooking channel? You know, do, like, are you looking for something where you can literally follow along step by step with um, a chef? Do you want, you know, feedback? What can I do? What can't I do? What should I change? What should I leave? Etc.
at a mic to myself, yes. Um, that's a thought that already went through um, my head, Brett. As soon as I started editing the video, I was like, oh shit, yeah, I need to put a mic on me. Um, and I also make sure that I use my photography camera on the tripod that I've got coming. Um, to do the filming as well so that there's less background movement and noise and all that it's a much more steady so that'll be implemented hopefully from the second or the third video I know the camera on the tripod will be implemented from the second video microphone might have to wait for the third video um, yeah yeah so that's what I was thinking is uh, well David I was thinking of making the channel at least at the start I'm talking about the chef channel here a kind of cook along with the chef style thing so that you don't um, necessarily have to follow a recipe like I will step by step by step by step uh, you through. Some instructions on how to cook in the description. Absolutely, Tony. I'll uh, make sure that there is instructions in the description when the videos go up on the cooking channel. Um, I'm more than happy to pop that in the cooking on the fly videos as well because obviously the cooking channel won't just have cooking on the fly videos it'll have all sorts of recipe videos it'll have food reviews drink reviews um, you know all sorts of things mukbangs all that sort of stuff Yeah, Glenn, so I'll, um, I'll make sure that the phone is still available for detail shots. Um, but I will do them, I'll do the detail shots volumeless so that there's none of the background noise of hands touching the phone that, you know, obviously goes through the phone speaker, etc. Also, who's Mr. Slippy Fist? <laughs> hey, Brett, do it. Trust me, mate, do it. I would love to see other people cooking and flying as well. Ah, lizard man is slippy fist. That would know. That would be why I don't know the um, name uh, as well as I know some of the others. But um, awesome. I was just uh, during the cooking. I was watching your flying. I was like, damn. I need a shot of me tearing one open. Uh, tearing one what? <laughs> yeah, Brett, do it. I mean, you know, if you if you don't want to do it alongside flying, Brett, um, I have no doubt if you were to create a channel called Brett Cooks, that people would watch. Oh, of opening the food. Okay, I see what you mean. Yeah, good point. Good point. I actually, uh, I did wonder that when I was editing the video, I was like, why didn't I get photos of me cutting in and doing the cross section and all that, but there you go. Yeah, no, very, very good point. Very good point. Probably almost uh, should have done like a taste test on video as well. But uh, you know. These are all things that I can implement into the second videos and further. Yeah, exactly right, David. I'd watch a channel called Brett Cooks. What am I calling it? Cooking on the fly. For the videos that are related to the areas that we're flying in, it's cooking on the fly.
But um, in terms of the actual cooking channel as well, there's going to be a series um, on that channel which is literally going to be uh, one pot or one pan wonders or cooks where you literally only need one cooking utensil. I'm going to call that the only pans cooking show. It doesn't need to have nudes. I'm not cooking nude. I've already been over that bit. Um, <laughs> your only pans link. That's exactly right. Um, I think somebody asked me before what the ETA was on the flight. So let's bring up the uh, fur map. So I'd say we're just over halfway. Wow, there's some interesting weather out there in the distance, I must say. Just along that uh, edge of the clouds there. Yeah, no, no explicit content on the only pan. The only explicit content will be the language, basically. But um, other than obviously the Koshinya and Pastel, that's obviously going to go up um, and become live sometime tomorrow on the channel, um, probably one of the first dishes I'm going to do is fried rice, mainly because I need to compete with, uh, Fozzy, and I also want Uncle Roger to come at me. Lizard Man says, if you're doing long flights, could you stagger some dishes so you can do multiple and be making during oven time? Yeah. Um, absolutely. I only, for this first time round, I only wanted to do about an hour or so of cooking because originally people were going to cook along, but with the, um, removal and then re-implementation of lockdown and me going away on holidays and pushing the stream back and blah, 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 that sort of didn't become a thing this time around. Uh, now that I know I have extra time, um, I might, you know cook something that takes a little bit longer or whatever uh, so that yeah there is that uh, ability to stagger it or push it out over a longer period of time but it's a fantastic suggestion lizard man Dan says, I enjoyed your cooking video. I might suggest that you have a real passion for it that poured through that video. Perhaps follow that passion as I think you'll do well with it. Um, Dan, look, that is, that is the um, thought process. Um, it's very, very difficult with the lockdowns to stay motivated to do it in a commercial uh, presence in, you know, kitchens and pubs and all that outside. Obviously, it's very different when you're doing it for yourself and when you're doing it in your own business. So that's more what I'm focusing on. I'm focusing on the gaming channel, the chefing channel, um, and then business plan that I've got, uh, that I'm currently working on as well, um, behind the scenes for doing food related things. Um, yeah. Plus on top of that, also studying real estate, just in case it doesn't pick up or pisses me off or whatever. Because the fact of the matter is the YouTube channel is not going to uh, go away kind of thing. I'm always going to be cooking and 
flying and gaming and all that because that's something I like to do in my spare time. So they're always going to be here and there's always going to be that um, uh, the cooking and stuff on there. So even if I don't end up succeeding with things outside, fine, I've still got this, you know, and I can still explore the passion and all that in my own time, I guess. Um, Tony, I'm open to anything, bro. If you want to watch me cook in a spa, you can watch me cook in a spa. But of course, there is absolutely a passion for cooking there. You know, I grew up um, with a nonna and a nonno cooking in an Italian family with my mom and them and all that. Um, and I've been now chefing for 10 years or so. So there's absolutely a passion there. It's just lockdown made it very difficult to, and the pandemic made it very difficult to continue that passion working for others because it was so up and down, you know? Um, one week you had 40 hours, the next week you had 10 hours, you know? And then you didn't have a job for two weeks and then it came back and it became exhausting and I didn't want that to ruin the passion so I got out and decided to focus on my own things where I can keep the passion going where's Shane when you need him uh, where is Shane when you need him cook in a flight suit um, actually I might be able to achieve that because I've got a uh, suit jacket that I just need to then put the stripes on Um, I don't speak Arabic, but I will translate that, um, sorry, I don't know your name because it's, uh, written in Arabic, but let me translate that in Google Translate and I'll see what, um, may or may not be. Peace, mercy, and blessings of God be upon you. Thank you very much. Same to you. Um, as I said, I'm not exactly sure of what your name is. Let me um, throw that in Google Translate as well. Is your name something along the lines of uh, Rakan or Rakan or Rakan? Not a problem, Brett. All good, mate. You uh, look after yourself, bro. Have a good rest, etc. And uh, I will see you tomorrow, probably in uh, Shane's stream, mate. But um, to our uh, Arabic fellow who's dropped into the chat, you're a very kind man. Thank you so much for the messages. Um, I hope you are doing well as well. I hope you can uh, understand what I'm saying. If not, I hope you understand that thumbs up means you're awesome. And uh, thank you so much for coming along. Uh, I don't know. Salam alaikum. Yeah, um, I must say that, I mean, not that I was concentrating for the last hour and a half or so when I was playing the um, cooking video, but the scenery on this flight just hasn't been quite to the level that it was last night. I don't know if anybody else is like, you're full of shit, mate. You obviously haven't been concentrating. It's been phenomenal, but um, I just sort of get that vibe.
No worries, David, mate. You look after yourself, bro. I'll uh, hopefully see you tomorrow in Shane's stream, bro. Let me know how things are going with you in your life over, you know, tomorrow in the next couple of days, mate. And uh, cheers. This is from the local uh, brewery, Bandelier Brewing. This is a red ale or a copper ale. It's quite a nice uh, drop, but uh, I recommend no more than a can because it's got a decent amount of alcohol in it. For the hell of it, but that's irrelevant now. We should talk about with us. How come we're holding on? Cause really, I don't see the benefits now. When you're broken, my trust. So I just wonder, why do I fall back to you? Really, nothing I can do about it. Why do I fall back to you? It's like you're a drug to me. I can't quit. It's not like we're still 22, trying something new just to pass time. I don't think that we ever could work this out. None of it makes sense. There's no reason why. Why I still fall back to you? back hope you enjoyed uh some of the just ambiance of me not talking continuously and just the music rudin says my brother-in-law went to culinary school i didn't think 
they would be able to teach him to cook. They did. That boy can cook now. It is a mad. It is amazing, Vruden. If you're even if you're not planning on following it as a career, it is amazing what cooking school can teach you, just to elevate your home cooking to another level. You don't want to be the one to clean the kitchen afterwards. Okay, so Vruden, that's. I don't know if your brother-in-law has continued down the chef um, pathway since he went to culinary school, but you'll find, and Fozzie will be able to back me up on this, and David will probably be able to back me up on this as well if he wasn't uh, already gone. That is that as you become better and better as a chef, you become cleaner and cleaner and more organized and eventually you don't have to worry about having the kitchen in a mess or having to clean up the kitchen after that person's cooked or whatever because they just keep it clean as they go. Sit at home and burns money. He should, um, if he can cook, he should, um, he should do something with that, even if it's just like a YouTube channel or something. Something to keep him occupied, keep his skills, you know. And I thought I was being messy with flour in that cook. With a little bit of um, flour around the work area, but um, there you go. Stu, mate, look after yourself. Stay safe, stay well. Uh, I bid you adios and adieu and all those things. And uh, I'm sure because we won't see you tomorrow because you'll be uh, at work. That we'll see you probably sometime during the week. He has other problems. Working won't work for him. No, that's fair enough. That's why I'm saying um, if he was to take his skills and, I don't know, implement them, and maybe it doesn't work for him as well, but um, implement them into like a YouTube thing or, uh, you know, uh, start canning and jarring some of his awesome products and selling them online or stuff like that. I don't know. These are all th thoughts that I've had recently um, brooded with the whole pandemic thing. So just basically listing off the things that have gone through my brain of things that I can do at home to still potentially make money, etc. Wow, Icarus, that was um, quick. <laughs> Um, I don't think I'm moving that fast. I'm moving at 143 knots across the ground. He doesn't deal well with stress at all. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, definitely not in a commercial kitchen. Um premises then absolutely not um do not recommend at all but i mean if he was to just start making like pasta sauce and jam and all those um things is that something that he could possibly do or I've been doing 110, have I? I thought I was doing faster than 110. You're going 145 in the helicopter. Bloody hell, Vruden. That's a quick heli. But if you keep doing 145, mate, you will catch me. Eventually. You don't think you can handle it? Fair enough. All good, all good. Still, um, you guys get to benefit from his amazing cooking skills when he cooks um, something. I mean, okay, yeah, the kitchen needs a bit of a cleanup, but I'm sure it's worth everything when you taste the food. So, that's good. That's good. Like, 
I'm a big uh, fan of everybody knowing how to cook um, to at least some sort of basic level. I think it's a very important life skill that will get you very, very far. It'll help you to keep your bills under control when you do live out of home, especially when you move out early um, in your life. I think it is something that not enough people have enough understanding of how to do basic things. And you don't need to, um, you know, you don't need to uh, do like super complex things or whatever. Just the knowledge of how to make like a pasta sauce to put on your dried pasta and how to perfectly cook some rice and how to, you know, test whether meat is cooked and chicken is cooked and, uh, you know, basic things like that. How to cook an omelette, how to fry an egg, how to poach an egg. Really basic skills like that, which will then enable you to do um, simple things like, you know, poached eggs on toast for breakfast and... You know, uh, make a lovely roasted vegetable pasta for a dinner, and yeah, he's in Japan, so you don't get to eat the food. Oh, that's it. That's um, annoying. So you also don't have to clean the kitchen, though. Yeah, fair enough, uh, Vruden. Uh, Dan says he's off. No worries, Dan, mate. Appreciate the kind words. You look after yourself, bro. Uh, and I'm sure I will see you round in either my streams or Shane's streams or Brett's streams or any of the awesome people within this community who do streams and videos. Uh, Glenn says he got inspired to air fry frozen trips, frozen trips, frozen chips and chili tenders this flight. Hmm, I wonder what inspired you to do that, Glenn? Hmm. <laughs> no, that's good, Glenn. That's, I mean, and that's, that's what I mean. Like the fact that a simple task of knowing to Put some chips and some chili tenders in an air fryer, how long to cook it for, what temperature to cook it at. These are really basic things, and yeah, okay, chips and, you know, chili tenders are not what I would call a balanced meal, but at the same time, it means that somebody is not going hungry, and they're not ordering out, and they're not wasting their money kind of thing, you know? Yeah, Vruden, you need to make sure that you staff well. Stay well as well, but staff well too. So I think it was Fozzie who suggested to me before um, that I should do like basic cooking things on my uh, chefing channel, you know? Basic knife skills. Best way to fry an egg, poach an egg, make an omelette. You know, the basics of cooking pasta and stuff like that. And I'd be more than happy to do something like that. I guess the only thing that I could say in relation to that is that Nat's what I reckon already sort of does something like that. But I guess I could uh, take on that idea and instead of making six or seven minute... Um, videos about it do like what i just did you know video the whole thing and provide a step by step so that people feel like as if they're got somebody alongside them the whole way i guess that's how i could differentiate anyway i'm going to uh quick intermission and i will be back Well, sleep with the doors unlocked. Ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I might as well sleep with the doors unlocked. Ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I might as well sleep with the doors unlocked. Never been in love. Yeah, I'm still waiting for the one 
Looking for someone who cares about my needs. Ain't nobody calling my phone up just to make sure I get home safe and sound. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if I fall down and don't get up, nobody would care. Yeah, don't wanna be alone anymore. So I might as well sleep with the doors unlocked. Ooh, ooh, yeah, yeah. Ooh, ooh, I might as well sleep with the doors unlocked. Ooh, ooh, yeah, yeah. Ooh, ooh, I might as well sleep with the doors unlocked. If you love me, let me hear you say my name. Teach people to make airline food? I mean, airline food is just normal everyday food that's been packaged and seasoned to uh, be palatable at 35,000 feet. Because, of course, when you're at 35,000 feet, your taste buds are nowhere near as strong as they are at sea level. So they need to do different things when it comes to seasoning the food, etc. But um, especially business class and first class food is literally a carbon copy of what you would receive on the ground, just seasoned differently. So I get what you're saying uh, there, Glenn, but I don't really need to change what I'm doing because all food is able to be airline food. But I guess if there was a way that I could um, present it to look like it's come from an airline, then sure, that's something I'd be very interested in um, potentially uh, pursuing. I must say, this is quite a long flight, this one, although it's quite nice to see that the scenery has changed now, because it was getting a little bit... Um, like the photogrammetry over that last part that we've been flying over for the last little bit was not so fantastic. So it's quite nice to um, have it elevated again. But we are coming down to our waypoint soon where we make a turn towards Salvador. Yeah, which is why a lot of, uh, that, exactly right, Blake, that's why a lot of people who fly um, economy class in not so favorable airlines always complained, um, you know, the food doesn't taste good, the food doesn't have much flavor, the food's this, the food's that, simply because they can't taste it as if they did on the ground. If they had that same dish on the ground, they'd be like, oh, this is really good, you know, like a high quality frozen meal sort of um, thing. Teach guys to make bachelor chow, you know, stuff you can freeze and reheat swell. Yeah, well, that's, um, 
Even though I'm a chef, Rudin, that's exactly what I do. I make big batches, I portion it, I freeze it. I've probably got, in my freezers, probably three months worth of dinner of various dishes. So I go through, I make a shitload of food, I freeze it, I eat it, I run out, I go again, I go to the shop, so I drop a couple of hundred bucks, I buy all the ingredients, I cook it up, I portion it, freeze it, and then I don't have to cook again for two or three months. And it's not just um, dinners that I've got portioned as well, I've got uh, frittata in there that I can do for breakfasts. I've got pancakes that I've done, um, so I literally just have to take them out, heat them, bit of berries, bit of banana, bit of maple syrup, done. Breakfast, sorted. Um, you know, I have always make sure I've got bread in the freezer. Um, so that I can literally just do half an avo, smash, 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 spread that. Whilst I'm doing that, I've got an egg poaching on the stove, bang. Poached eggs on avocado on bread, done. Um, I have pulled chicken and pulled beef that is portioned at 100 grams in my freezers. Literally, take it out, put some salad mix in a bowl, put some of the nuts and stuff, make a quick dressing with a bit of oil and vinegar, salt, bit of the flavoured uh, chicken that I have portioned, bang. I've got a salad for lunch or whatever, you know. It enables me, you know, that, that removes basically like 10 hours of cooking time a week that I just don't have to plan ahead for because my food is all ready to go. Yeah, exactly right, Brutus. And something, pancakes is something that you can make a large batch of um, without it breaking the bank. You know, cook them up, portion them up, and then, yeah, literally, you just have to make sure that you have some frozen berries in the freezer. Um, you know, maybe a banana here and there. And that, that's the amazing thing as well about pancakes. If you don't have anything to put on them except maybe like a bit of peanut butter or a bit of Nutella, guess what? That's really good on pancakes. Pancakes are so versatile that you could even just butter the pancakes. Yes, poached eggs do freeze well. I mean, I don't, because by the time you take the avocado, halve it, scoop the flesh out, season it, mash it, the piece of bread is um, toasted, the poached egg is basically ready. But yeah, absolutely it is, 100%. You can uh, pre-poach your eggs and then freeze them and then... Yep, big chest freezer. I've got a 450 litre chest freezer. Yeah, something like that. Massive thing. And it's a lifesaver. Oz Flight Simmer. Catch you later, ladies and gents. Same to you, mate. No worries for the uh, video. I'd love to see you do a cooking video sometime, Shane. But uh, do look after yourself, bro. Stay safe, etc. And uh, I will see you tomorrow in your stream, Shane. Just want to hope the power doesn't go out for ages and ruin all that food. I mean, yeah, I guess there is that risk there. Um, I guess the good thing with such a large chest freezer is that it holds its temperature. So even if the power goes out for three, four, five, six hours, the risk of me losing anything, as long as I make sure I don't open the freezer, is pretty low because the temperature like, I run my um, fridges and freezers. I run my fridges at the point of where they almost want to freeze food. And I run my freezers at basically the absolute maximum. Now, I know that's not the best thing for the environment, but what it basically means is that I always know that my food, 
whether it's in the fridge or the freezer, is frozen, uh, uh, sorry, not frozen, is fresh as it possibly can be and will last as long as it possibly can. And if I do have a power outage, as long as I don't open the doors, I'm good. I'm not, the chances of me losing that product is very minimal. I cannot believe how the landscape has changed below us in the last 15, 20 minutes or so. We've gone from not quite, like almost non-photogrammic scenery to this phenomenal coloration of the land below. Almost blue and then brown and then burnt orange and white. It's just, again, I come back to what I was saying earlier on in the stream. I want to travel to Brazil. Yeah, me too, Black Evo. My freezer, my deep freezer anyway, is starting to run a little bit low. My um, my three fridges freezers um, are still pretty stocked up. But um, yeah, I'm starting to look in my deep freezer and go, ooh. Blizzard Van says he had a power outage for six hours one time, checked chest freezer temperature when it came back on, totally fine. That's exactly right. As long as the chest freezer doesn't go above zero, and even if it does go above zero, as long as it doesn't go above five degrees for any more than four hours, your food is fine. Because it has not entered the temperature danger zone at any point in time. And it ha as long as it doesn't enter the temperature danger zone for... Um, I mean, in commercial cooking, it's two hours for obvious reasons, but it's okay up to four hours. So you could have a power outage for almost 24 hours with most chest freezers these days, and you probably find that your food is still usable. No problem. Yikes! Four hurricanes in six weeks. Power was out for ten weeks. Yeah, well, look, um, that's probably not going to be... If you've got a chest freezer and the power's out for ten weeks, you're probably not going to... Um, your food's probably not going to survive that, unfortunately. Brazilian music festivals on YouTube are an eye-opener. The entire crowd knows all the words and all sing along and are all in tune. Aussies sort of sit there and watch and get drunk. <laughs> yep, we do. Oh, wow. Hell yeah, Vruden. That would have been bloody amazing. You would have had so many different foods available. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point, Black. At that point, I do think there is bigger problems. The bar had power. <laughs> what else do you need in the world other than a bar that has power? I don't know what others um, 
think, but I would say my personal preference. I reckon this is one of the best songs in my um, Flight Sim playlist. I think uh, for somebody to have such a phenomenal vocal range is just... Could just be me though. You have a generator at home just in case. Yeah, I've um, I've been weighing that up as well, Black Evo. Not not for my uh, not for me personally, but uh, a couple of months ago when we had the floods here, um, my other half up at the farm, she was without power for a fortnight almost. Um, and they were talking about how you know it would be beneficial to have a generator, and I was sort of thinking. Uh, yeah, having a generator or having um, solar panels with a battery on the house to sort of help in a situation like that or a combination of both. Um, yeah. You spent 10 weeks running the computer off of a power inverter off the car. New South Wales was talking about interest-free loans to get solar and Tesla. I mean, hey, that would be pretty good. I know South Australia's now, uh, at least at parts of Adelaide City Council, are powered completely by solar and um, a Tesla battery. Which I think is pretty cool. Generators just have to be powerful enough to power the freezer. That's exactly right. Because you put all your stuff out of your fridge into the freezer and the stuff that can't be frozen, you eat it. August in Fla. What is Fla? Is Fla Florida? Okay, yeah, so I was right. I thought it might have been Florida, but I was just like, mm, I don't want to go make assuming because you know what assuming does? It makes an ass out of you and me. Problem in New South Wales is some local councils deem houses that are not on the grid as not fit for habitation. Huh? <laughs> I mean, that's that's that that seems ridiculous, you know. Um, if the place has got running water, power, gas, all the things that it needs, just because it's not connected to the grid, that seems insane. There's no freedom in this country anymore, you know? If I want to make my own power and water and all that, let me make my own power and water. That's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. 
I want nothing more when I have a house that is not being rented to have my own power generation, my own, you know, water generation, like a water tank or whatever. I want all of those things because I don't want to rely on private companies to provide those things to me at exorbitant prices. I would rather do those things on my own and pay nothing, almost. Like, I look at that as the ultimate freedom. Not only do I have my own house that I can do whatever I basically want to, to especially on the inside, but I provide my own power, I provide my own water, I provide, you know. If you collect rainwater and use it in your house, you still have to pay water rates even though you haven't used the system. Yeah, speaking of that, um, Black Eva, when I had my block of land, I still had to pay water rates even though there was no house on there and no water connected simply because it was a block of land that was titled and therefore they, they had the, provided the pipe to the underneath part of the block therefore I had to pay for the fact that that pipe existed it was $400 a year for the privilege of the fact that a piece of pipe existed under a block of land that wasn't in use. Yeah, it is. The th it's the same thing they do with um, when people have solar on their house and they don't have a battery system to store their solar so they put it back into the grid they increase the um, power generation within the grid to exceed the um, feed-in tariffs so that people with solar get less uh, money back on their feed-in tariffs Meaning that even though they have solar, they still have to pay more than what they actually would for their uh, power consumption. It's just... It is literal bullshit. The Homeowners Association for my rental property now wants $200 a year for the privilege of renting out my own house. Verd and I tell them to go screw themselves. Glenn says, when I lived on a property out west of Moree, the rainwater and river water in the area was not drinkable due to the pesticide overspray from the cotton. Even though they sprayed at night with wheel sin, the cotton still much overspray. Glenn, the... I've... I don't want to get political right now, especially in this stream, but I have spent a lot of time following um, floodplain harvesting and cotton farming and, um, you know, people like Helen Dalton and Jordan Shanks and all that who do a lot of research into these things and the behind the scenes shit that goes on with cotton farming and floodplain harvesting in this country is fucked. <laughs> it is fucked. <laughs> That's insane, Bruden. Absolutely insane. 
That is some sort of nonsense. I'll tell you exactly why we grow cotton in a water critical country like Australia, Black Evo. Money, money, money. Money, money, money. Because the amount of money you make as a cotton farmer. Why the hell would you grow anything else? Yeah, and also because it's owned by the Chinese, it's been sold to the Chinese, exactly. Anyway, I don't want to get, because if we go any further in this conversation, I'm going to get extremely political about it, and I don't want to do that in a flight stream that we've been doing food stuff. I'll, uh, I'll post a few of the videos and all that in the no political correctness part of the Discord, if people are interested um, and they haven't seen some of the stuff that uh, Helen and Jordan and all that have, uh, and Michael West have uncovered. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, your lawyer sounds like a good bloke, Vruden. Yeah, I'll get angry as well, Black, don't you worry. Hey, Beluga on PC. How are you going, mate? Welcome to the stream. You've uh, you've missed the cooking side of things, but we're still um, cooking along in the aircraft, if that uh, <laughs> makes sense. But um, I do hope you're doing well, mate. I do hope you are staying safe, etc. I hope your uh, Saturday has been kind to you and that your Sunday has uh, many things planned. Oh, you saw the cooking. Sweet. Okay, I'm glad. I'm glad. That makes me feel slightly better, mate. I, I do hope you enjoyed the cooking, and uh, obviously uh, you'll know that it's available on this channel and the Shepping channel if you ever want to follow along and have a shot at uh, cooking them yourself. More um, non-photogrammetric areas here. But uh, we should be about to turn and cross back into some photogrammetric scenery for the last part of this flight, which will be nice. If you are, if when you are flying in uh, flight sim, if you do see these little patches of what looks like uh, generated farmland that's just sort of placed, this is where they were not able to get photogrammetric um, scenery, so they just place this. Is this ultra? Uh, it is uh, a mixture of high and ultra. Not um, not for frame rate purposes, Beluga, but if I've noticed that if I put everything on Ultra, I get blue screens. I'm pretty sure it just pushes the graphics card too far. Whereas if I mix it up between High and Ultra, I manage to achieve a completely smooth, I'm able to stream, there's no issues with crashing or blue screens or any of that stuff. Like this was meant to be. 
Your lawyer was your college roommate and he took great pleasure in saying you should have gone to the meeting. Are we talk what hang on, what meeting are we talking about? The one um about the association who wants to charge you $200 a year to rent out your own house or Yeah, Glenn, I'm not exactly sure what my exact numbers are, but they're probably around what you were saying. When you upgrade your PC, Beluga, you'll be able to run Ultra. It'll be a big difference from low. Oh, hell yeah. I, I've never seen this sim at anything less than high settings. So I can't imagine what it looks like at low settings, but um, I'm assuming it's probably not too bad considering, but yeah, you'll, you'll notice a huge difference. You'll be like... Whoa! He thought that was hilarious. Yeah, I think it's complete. Like, I think it's hilarious in a um, messed up way, Rudin. Imagine thinking that you can uh, charge the homeowner of the house a fee per year for that homeowner to rent out their own house. Like, <laughs> oh, bloody hell. Well, yeah, Beluga, if I'm not streaming, I can crank my... Um, Scenery back up to ultra everything and I get almost 40 frames per second in New York So yeah, hundred percent you'll be able to get 30 FPS in New York. No problem. I've only got a 5700 XT uh, Graphics card, so it's not like a world beater. It's the equivalent of like a 1080 Ti a high level 1080 Ti so Yeah, no, Bruden, I, I think it's um, hilarious that they think that should even be a thing. Yeah, that's not a bad um, setup there, Beluga. Not a, not a bad one at all. Pretty sure um, one of the main YouTube uh, flight sim streamers, Droya, um, runs a 1660 Super and a 3500 or 3600X or whatever it is. Um, he's is always he's always on high ultra and streaming no problem at 30 plus frames a second. So. But um, that'll be, I'll be, uh, make sure that when you do that beluga that you can uh, pop some photos in the Discord, you know, I'm always keen to see when people are building new things, got new toys, all sorts of um, stuff. I'm, uh, I'm very much big into the whole celebrating people's success and when they get that upgrade that they've been working so hard towards and you know or they, they they get that new toy that they're so excited about i'm always big into please 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 promote that within the discord you know be like hey wow you know
You turned everything to ultra and you were getting weird water effects in VR. I wonder if that's VR related or um, to the sim or combination of both or whatever. It's interesting, Bruden. Very interesting. Yeah, please do, Beluga. Um, I should probably put like a few more um, bits and pieces in the Discord in relation to people's PC builds and stuff like that, because I'm always very interested in what people are using and running and uh, all that sort of stuff. Your graphics were awful after Sim Update 5 until you plugged the HDR screen back in. Oh! Well, no, I guess that makes sense, because um, everything these days is all about that HDR, so yeah. Alright, so we've just made that turn. So I reckon... I'm just going to make an estimate that we've probably got about 150 nautical miles to go. Because so we've got about 70 to Mume or Nume or whatever it is. Or Mumev. And then... Yeah, so I'm going to say... 150 nautical miles or thereabouts would be so probably just over an hour's worth of flying left to go yeah Tim probably time for you to join in mate probably as I was just saying I don't know if you uh, caught that but uh, we've got about an hour or so I would say Lizard man, it has been as much of a pleasure for me as well as uh, it has for you, judging by what you've said. But uh, much appreciated for the kind words. Do look after yourself um, and, you know, do all the stay safe, stay well, etc. You know, uh, considering the situation across the globe. And uh, I'm sure I will catch you sometime around. That is a... <laughs> is that your departure uh, aerobatics I love it I love it but uh, yeah have a good rest mate and uh, I'm sure I will see you in somebody's stream very soon uh, Tim which airport to jump in at that is a really good question mate um, probably Probably that airport, Tim, I would say, would be your best bet. Yeah. I don't think there's anything else that's uh, super close by. No, there's not. So, yeah. Oh, music stopped. Yeah. Lucas says, I was at the pool today, but I have hay fever, so when I came out, the changing rooms were roasting and I couldn't stop sneezing. Everybody would have thought you had had COVID, um, Beluga. We are roughly halfway. Really? I could have sworn we were halfway quite a while ago. Ah, the man is now ghosting me. However, his um, helicopter blade is not moving. So, Vruden is floating. But, I think I might... Whoops.
Yeah, I'm sure it is running, Bruden. It's just um, my sim being silly. Wow, everyone's so far away from the rest of us. I was going to uh, take the drone out to the rest of you, but it's going to take forever. <laughs> Scotland is level zero for COVID. When you say level zero, do you mean like there's no cases or? There you go, your um, blades are moving now, Bruden. There is some cases. Bloody hell, New South Wales today recorded like 825 cases or something. It's the most cases in a 24 hour period since the pandemic began here in Australia. I feel really sorry for um, people in New South Wales. Scotland needs to detach from England and float off into the North Sea. <laughs> I'm sure there's people in Scotland who agree with you, Glenn. Judging by that reaction, Beluga might be one of those people who agrees with you, Glenn. <laughs> disappointed in the uh, complete lack of photogrammetric scenery in this uh, part of the world. It's all AI generated stuff. Looks a bit like FSX, honestly. South America does need a world update. That's exactly right, Glenn. I'm, uh, I've started to realize that across Brazil, like 
The scenery that uh, is around the Amazon is fantastic. The scenery that is along the coastline is fantastic. The scenery that is sort of in between those two uh, touristy places, like the central part of Brazil, really needs a good, and I'm assuming a lot of South America is like that. I know Venezuela, when we uh, were first flying into South America, had some mm, not so good parts of scenery as well. So, yeah. You're working on your new PFP. I'm an old um, fart beluga. You're going to have to let me know what PFP means. <laughs> Yep, absolutely, um, Black Evo. Although I will say, I feel like Australia, with some updated airports and some cityscapes and um, just like a bit of focus put on um, very scenery-centric areas like, um, you know, in central Queensland, central Western Australia, central Northern Territory, those sorts of areas, uh, the rock formations and the national park areas and all that. Other than that, Australia is pretty good so far. I'm sure it can be improved. Absolutely, I'm sure it can be improved. But in terms of Southern Hemisphere, I feel like Australia and South Africa got pretty um, got pretty good in terms of southern hemisphere New Zealand's fantastic now that it's got the Orbex New Zealand mesh yeah very true Glenn very true The good stuff, now correct me if I'm wrong, especially Black Evo on this, but the good stuff is usually taken from aircraft, passenger aircraft. Like the, when I say the good stuff, I mean the um, stuff that is high detail right down to very, very close. It's taken from mapping aircraft. Okay, so not not quite what I was uh, thinking. I'd be interested to see if Microsoft ever takes any um, scenery from the same people that do aerial photography for Google Maps. That would make me laugh quite a lot if that was ever to become a thing. Hey, looks like we might be coming to the end of this uh, auto-generated scenery possibly so let's uh take a frontwards view for a little bit
Google just pl uh, paid for their suppliers for most of theirs. Bing could do the same. It's all about the dollars. Yeah, well, you can tell when you look at um, mapping software who's spending the big dollars on the mapping imagery and who's necessarily not spending as big a dollars, I guess. I think people can kind of figure out what I'm hinting at there, but uh, with the most part, now there is exceptions to that rule. Hong Kong is one of them, but with the most part, I tend to find that Google Earth and Google Maps has better imagery. However, in Hong Kong, Bing Maps has better imagery than uh, Google does. The thing that I don't, like, the thing that I find quite crazy is you've got these strips of photogrammetric satellite and uh, mapping aircraft imagery, but there's only these little sections and pockets and, and then all the surrounding area is autogen. Yeah, that's exactly right, Black. The Hong Kong actually within the sim is not that impressive, despite the fact that Bing Maps has better photogrammetric imagery than what Google does, at least on their online platforms. Um, you do, yeah, I, I, I found that uh, you do need to purchase an aftermarket city pack for Hong Kong to really make it look like Hong Kong. Um, yeah, I think to some degree you may be correct there, Black Evo, but I've also noticed it to be a thing in areas that quite clearly do not have cloud cover uh, when the photos were taken. So I'm assuming that there may also be a situation where uh, whether under the regulations of that particular country or the aircraft that's taking the imagery or the people down below in those certain areas don't want um, aerial imagery uh, able to be taken or they are requesting a certain amount of money to allow the imagery to be taken, etc, etc. I'd say there's also a lot of that. Okay, I did not know that Glenn, there you go. You love the fact that you gave up and went to bed last night and you didn't even miss the stream. Um, Vruden, that's because I gave up on that stream when it uh, when trying to play that 4K video and all that actually caused um, a blue screen. I was just like, usually as you would know from previous experiences like that, I would come back within a few minutes this time, I was like, fuck this. I'm coming back later on in the evening. I just got to that point of screw this, screw that. Um, as I was saying, I don't know if you heard, but as I was saying to some of the blokes at the start of the stream, we got given 90 minutes notice that we were going into lockdown. 90 minutes. So I was a little bit frazzled when I started that stream earlier today and I should have just read the room and gone, you know what, I just need to postpone this to the time that I started the stream this evening. Realistically, I should have just done that. Realised that I wasn't in the mood to do good content at that time. 
Yeah, exactly. Sometimes it is better to just walk away and start again. Hindsight's a wonderful thing, and now here we are coming towards the end of the cooking stream. And I'm in a good mood, and I've had a good time, and I've enjoyed chatting to all of you, and yeah. Yes, well, 90 minutes, yes, that's exactly right. I think it was actually two hours, but by the time most people found out, they had 90 minutes to get their shit together before... They had to be in lockdown. And that re like hearing that made me feel so bad for my friends and all that who have got restaurants and cafes and because that was announced at 11 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. and by 1 p.m. people had to be in lockdown. So that means that those restaurants who had spent all morning prepping for this busy Saturday and Sunday lunch now cannot use that food unless they are significantly busy which doesn't always happen during lockdowns it means that people who were meant to work the whole day were no longer required to work the whole day it's <laughs> this is another pathway I don't want to get started on a stream because it's just going to end up getting political and then I'm going to get angry about it, other people are going to get angry about it and it's just... Yeah. It's the thing that, it, it, that inability to provide notice is the th reason that I don't have my own hospitality business yet. Because I keep getting scared away every time that occurs. You know, I'm sort of in the process, I'm chatting to people, I've got plans laid out, and then there's a lockdown that's announced with a couple of hours notice, and I'm just like, whoa, no, 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 I'm not ready for this, I'm not ready for this. If they were able to give 24 or 40 out, 48 hours notice, it's completely different. But yeah, the fact that a lot of these lockdowns recently have been implemented with two, three, four hours notice at the absolute maximum is just... Yeah. People like myself who do not have a huge financial backing would get killed in situations like what happened today. I didn't even see your um, comment there, Black Evo, about uh, minimum resolution size the Sobo wants to use. That's also a very good point. I'm, uh, I'm quite glad that for most of the rest of Brazil, I'm going to be trying to keep us um, towards the coastal areas and the touristy areas. So hopefully the photogrammetric scenery is very much available to us because I don't really want to keep flying over this autogen that looks like FSX. If I wanted to do that, I'll uh, go play FSX. Do I like your new profile picture? I certainly do, Beluga. It's very good.
All right, I'm going to uh, take another quick stretch of the legs. I'll be back in a couple of minutes.
Alright, the legs are stretched, the scenery has come back, and we are about to make our first proper turns as we come towards uh, SBSV or Salvador. I love how Vruden is still ghosting me. It's absolutely awesome. There we go, turn time. This will position us directly towards the coast. Hopefully the scenery just continues in its uh, lovely way that it is uh, going now. So we are 28 nautical miles from the first waypoint of the descent. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. I know a few of you are probably closer than that. I've also noticed that um, the maps have done a lot of work with the roads. Like, look below, you can now depict and make out the roads. Whereas I remember back, you know, in the early days of The Sim, the roads were just a complete debacle. So, it's nice to see that they've uh, Worked at that and made effort and uh, improved that uh, significantly. And I've noticed that they've done the same thing with uh, overpasses and bridges and all that stuff as well now. So you can actually determine when the roads are going up and over and around each other in certain areas. I think it's uh, really quite good that they've been moving with the times and updating and updating and updating. It's just a shame, as I was saying, about the fact that there's a lot of autogen scenery in the central parts of South America that are not uh, touristy or coastal or highly populated. Is that water? That's water. Is that a river, lakey thing, or is it actual? Oh no, that's actual ocean. Sweet. I'm calling pigeon. If you can uh, still hear me, mate. The TBM. Whenever I find, uh, whenever I fly the TBM, I find I can never get the autopilot to work. Is that just a me problem? Am I doing something wrong, or is the autopilot within that aircraft a bit? Uh, mm, how's your father kind of thing? Maybe it's a little bit 
selfish calling you up when I'm wasted When I know that you moved on Is she in your arms right now? Tell me is she gonna stay? In the TBM, there is a switch on the roof that has to be on for the autopilot to work. Okay. That explains a lot. No problem on your side, but you're also using the improvement mod. Okay. So that's the two areas that I'm obviously going wrong. A, I didn't realize there was a button on the roof that was required to make the autopilot work. B, I don't have the improvement mod. So, okay, cool. I'll make sure I remember that next time I take the TBM out. Because I usually take the TBM whenever Shane flies the DC-6. Because I don't have the DC-6. So, okay. I'll, uh, I'll figure it out now that I know where I'm going wrong. So I appreciate that, uh, Black Evo and Calling Pigeon. Such depressing lyrics in this song. <laughs> when you listen to it. It's got a great beat and keeps you, you know, but if you listen to the lyrics, you're like, oh, oh, oh. I mean, I guess that's a, um, it's a very good point that you make there, Black Evo. The autopilot works fine, you just have to make sure you have everything switched on properly. I guess that comes to, uh, to a similar scenario across all aircraft. You just have to make sure that you have everything switched on properly. <laughs> I mean, that would have certainly helped my situation had I just made sure that I had everything switched on. But uh, anyway, you live and you learn. Make sure that I also set active nav to GPS, follow the flight plan. Okay. I will absolutely make sure that I uh, confirm that that is set that way whenever I fly the TBM. In the Piper Warrior, they hid the avionics switch behind the right hand yoke. Yeah, that's not very helpful, is it? <laughs> you highly recommend the improvement mod. It makes the plane a lot more enjoyable to fly. All right, I'll... Um, Next time that I notice that Shane's going to do a DC-6 stream, or I want to participate in a DC-6 stream, I'll make sure I grab the improvement mod first, because that would be extremely beneficial to have an enjoyable plane to fly. Not that I don't think it's not an enjoyable plane, just, yeah, I obviously missed a few buttons that I obviously need to get. quite um, phenomenal. You can see the little pockets of rain out of the clouds and then the little pockets of sunshine and all that where there isn't any uh, inclement weather. And the weather in this sim really does, uh, other than when we have lightning storms and there's very few clouds in the sky, the weather in this sim is quite... Um, The King Air is also a very nice plane to use that is as capable as the TBM. Oh yeah, I forgot about the King Air actually. That's probably um, a better option for flying with the DC-6 because you've got the two engines. It's a little bit more passengery and less business aircrafty, I guess. It's interesting as well because I do fly the King Air a lot, so I don't know why I never really clicked with... Um, fly the, the King Air when people are flying like DC-6s and all that. My brain works in very interesting ways. I should really stop trying to analyze it. 
because I just end up giving myself a headache. <laughs> The autopilot and the King Air is a lot more user friendly. That's probably why I um, fly the King Air more than I do fly the TBM without really thinking about it. I don't know why I keep getting drawn to the TBM every time somebody's trying to fly the DC-6, but there you go. Um, the other one that fooled me is the arrows. They changed it so that you now need to turn the HGG switch on as well as the autopilot on to use GPS mode. And they didn't bother to tell you that um, bit, Glenn? Or is that just... The, I'm assuming that's what uh, you have to do in real life with the arrow. But I would be beneficial if they told um, people, by the way, we've made it more uh, study level and you now need to hit this, this, and this. I don't know. Maybe that's just my thought process. But... Hmm... They fixed it to be realistic. They probably made a comment on the update changelog, but who reads those? Yeah, what what is an update changelog? <laughs> that gives you an idea of how many ice have uh, read. That would be a big fat zero. Should call this song the uh, Pauline Hanson, you know. Please explain. Please explain. Nice little part of the world to live in, this would be. Doing that actually um, hurt quite a lot because all the uh, ribs, ribs, all the uh, what's this part called? The abs, the abs and the shoulder and all that are and the shoulders are extremely sore from uh, gymming the last few days. So all that twisting is just like. They have a lot of COVID right now. Yeah, they do. I know. They've had a lot of COVID um, basically since the start of the pandemic. Um, I'd still, you know, I would l love to see parts of Brazil once the uh, pandemic is over. I know it would require a lot of common sense because, you know, there's a lot of scenarios, unfortunately, with tourists being targeted by crime and stuff like that. But... Uh, that is an issue globally as well. But um, yeah, you know, I think I've, I know I've already said it a few times um, within these streams, but it is a country I would like to see, even if it was sort of, I went there, 
I did some um, aerial sightseeing of the tourist areas and then I sort of escaped into the more um, inner parts that are less touristy and there's, um, yeah. I don't know. You go to the gym to maintain that dad bod. <laughs> You would think, looking at me, that uh, especially when I've got that chef's uniform on with the apron nice and tightly tied around uh, here, that I'm not exactly a gym person, but I am. I'm the kind of person you'll see at the gym four, five, six times a week doing a mix of cardio and weights and um, toning and stretching and... I can only imagine how I would look if I didn't gym on the regular. In fact, I can tell you how I'd look if I didn't gym on the regular because uh, it's how I looked seven, eight years ago when I was 150 kilos or more. So that's like 300 pounds or something. So that's the reason I go to the gym. <laughs> to maintain the dad bod because without that, I would uh, have a lot more than a dad bod. Ride a llama across the Andes. Um, it's probably a little bit too out there for me. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't know because I haven't done any research into the whole um, thing, but I just sort of feel like that's a little bit... Uh, but I would need to do research into it before I made an actual committing comment either way. It does sound interesting. I'm not going to lie. It does sound interesting. It does sound like it would be really cool, but... Yeah. Yeah, never trust a skinny chef. Exactly. Never, ever, ever trust a skinny chef because that chef doesn't taste their food and doesn't eat their food. Hey, look, you know, I'm... I'm quite happy if I can maintain about 100 kilos. So that's, that's why I go to the gym. I just try to make sure that I don't exceed much past the three figures. I've never really had any success in getting it any lower than about 95, so I just sort of try to maintain that uh, 95 to 105 area, and if I notice that I'm creeping up, I put more effort in and change the diet even more and yeah you know like it's just a nice balancing act I guess Drop a little bit of altitude away here. Salvador is quite a large city now that I uh, get a good view of it. As you get older, that is true for most of us. Tim, I also think it's just... Um, the genes and metabolism I was given because my dad's about the same. 
His dad's about the same. His dad was about the same. Um, Weight-wise, my um, my mum's dad was about the same. Uh, his dad was about the same. So <laughs> I basically had no hope when it came to metabolism and genes. I was basically guaranteed that uh, no, what you, no matter what you do, mate, unless you survive on um, green smoothies and salads you're going to be about a hundred kilos. So yeah, I just, as you said, I try to make sure that I um, stay strong, stay healthy, stay fit. You know, despite that, I I have no issues in running five kilometers. I can run five kilometers, no problem. So we are on the ILS, I believe. Yep, we certainly are, because it just captured the localizer. quite see anything because of this uh, slightly foggy cloud that's in front of me, but I'm assuming we are basically beautifully lined up with the runway. This is the first time I'm going to try and use the ILS in a small aircraft like this all the way to the ground. Let's see what happens.
looking pretty good, I'm not going to lie. I've... It's been a while since I've used the ILS. The last time I used it, I was in a uh, Airbus A320. Okay, so that's the Getting a little bit of uh, turbulence off the trees as we come down. Uh, okay, now pitching up. Boy, pilot's off for this last little bit because... Um, okay, why are we pitching up so much aircraft? Why are we pitching up so much? Why are we pitching up so much? What the flipping hell? That was weird. We are very floaty here because the aircraft decided to trim up all of a sudden. There we go. We are down ski. Brakes, 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 brakes. Am I going to be able to sort of turn back in around on myself? Yes, I am. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Salvador in Brazil and almost at the end of the first cooking on the fly stream and judging by the feedback I've received this evening, this is certainly not going to be the last cooking on the fly stream. I promise to give everybody a bit more notice on the next one and I would love to have um, some of you cooking along live with me, that would be Absolutely awesome. out and around and then I'll jump in the drone and we'll get um, some video of uh, the arrival of Tim, Tim Brown. And then uh, that will be that. Alright. 
Beware of the sausage copter. Coming out to you, Tim. Don't worry about the random drone that's just been sent out in your direction. I really need to get some um, more Carinado aircraft because I don't have the 182. Looking like a decent approach here, Tim. Not going to lie to you, it's looking really, really good. If I mash all the buttons together. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Thank you very much, um, Black Evo. I just realized that people probably can't see Tim right now because my uh, bloody webcam thing's in the way. Looking really, really good here, Tim. About as floaty as I was, but uh, other than that, mate, can't can't really fault that one. Blown slightly off the center line in the end, but geez, I wouldn't complain about that landing, mate. Nice and smooth. Took your time. You were clearly in control. So well done. All right, let's uh, head back over to the pile of aircraft. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming along on the first Cooking on the Fly stream. I, uh, I really, really enjoyed getting that uh, done and I'm glad I did uh, persist and come back and do it a second time once I was in a... Uh, better place. The reward was massive to have all of you guys enjoy and have such good feedback about that. Um, this is the end of the stream. Obviously there will be um, more flights scheduled soon and I'll put the information out for that uh, either tomorrow or Monday. Also do keep an eye out on the Chef channel for um, the video of the pastel and cochinha. Um, yeah, but um, anyway, everyone, look after yourselves, stay safe, stay well, get well rested, enjoy uh, whatever you're getting up to for the rest of the weekend. Vruden, enjoy Ocean City, my good sir. And uh, I think that's it. Adios.